Money with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, in the Rose Bowl game on New Year's Day, Illinois upset the dope. And here he is, and he's still upset, Jack Benny. <laughs> Thank you. Hello again. This is Jack Benny talking. And Don, for your information, I wasn't upset at all. I enjoyed the game very much. Certainly was exciting, wasn't it, Jack? Yes, sir. And what a score. <laughs> Illinois, 45, UCLA, 14, and Al Hoysh, 103. <laughs> that was really something, wasn't oh, it? Oh, and what wonderful seats you had, Jack. Uh, how did you get such good tickets at the last minute? Well, Don, it wasn't easy. You see, even though I was born in Illinois, I've lived in California for the past 15 years. So in order to get two tickets, I called Governor Warren. You called the governor of California? Yes, yes. He couldn't do anything for me, so he called Governor Green of Illinois. Governor Green called President George Stoddard of the Illinois University. Uh, President Stoddard got in touch with Ray Elliott, the coach. Elliott got in touch with Buddy Young. And fortunately, Buddy Young happens to be a very good friend of Rochester. <laughs> So through Rochester, I not only got two seats on the 50-yard line, but I also got a sure thing in the fourth race at Santa Anita. <laughs> Say, Don, uh, who were you rooting for at the game? Well, Jack, I didn't want to show any partiality, so I got a seat on the UCLA side and a seat on the Illinois side. Well, Don, how could you possibly sit on both sides of the... Oh, oh, of course. <laughs> And, Don, weren't you disappointed when you weren't picked as the winning float? Huh? <laughs> well, better luck next year. Hiya, Jackson. Hello, Phil. Phil, get your band ready and... Phil, what happened to your orchestra? Half of your boys are missing. Where are they? Look, Jackson, New Year's Eve was only five days ago. Give them time. Give them time. <laughs> Say, what? Leave them alone and they'll come home, dragging their empties behind them. <laughs> I know, I know. But meanwhile, do the best you can with the boys... Oh, no, no. What's the matter, Jackson? Sammy, the bass fiddle player. Well, what about him? He's the best bass player in the country. I know, but look at his bass fiddle. It has six silver handles on it. <laughs> well, that's Sammy for you. If anything happens to him, you don't want us to go to no expense. <laughs> oh, fine. Look what he has carved on the bottom of it. R.I.P. What's that? Rest and Petrillo. Now cut that out! <laughs> and until something happens to him, tell Sammy to put down the shovel, use the bow, and blow out the candles on the music stand. Oh, uh, by the way, Phil, I saw you at the Rose Bowl game, New Year's Day. Oh, is that where I was? <laughs> Phil, you know where you were. That was a great game, wasn't it? What about that 103-yard run that Hoist made? Confidentially, Jackson, it was longer than that, but it won't go on record. What do you mean? He picked up the ball behind his old goal line, started down the field, ran up to the stands, asked me for my autograph, told me how to spell Harris, and then went on to make the touchdown. <laughs> what? If he'd have waited for me to dot the eye, they'd have nailed him on the 10-yard line. <laughs> well, I just show you how fast that boy is. Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Well, everybody's here now except Dennis. Where is he? I don't know. He hasn't come in yet. Well, how can we go on with the show if the cast doesn't get here on time? Oh, Jack, don't be mad at Dennis. I have to know something that you don't know. Don't tell me he has three shows. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jack, it isn't that. It's something you won't believe. What is it? Well, all of a sudden, Dennis got a big crush on me. A crush on you? How come? I don't know. Someone must have told him I was a girl. <laughs> Oh, Mary, stop kidding. Has, De has Dennis really got a crush on you? Yes, Jack, and he's so cute. Ever since last week when I danced with him in that nightclub, he's been sending me notes and little gifts. Gifts? What did he give you? Oh, lots of things. His Boy Scout knife, a bag of marbles, three Coca-Cola bottle caps filled with mud, <laughs> a ball of tin foil, a fish hook, and a stick of bubble gum. <laughs> no. Yes, and I'm worried. Why? If you see me wearing his bicycle clip, you'll know we're engaged. <laughs> well, how do you like that? And, Jack, you should see the note he sent me yesterday. Dennis sent you a note? Yeah, wait a minute. I'll read it to you. Oh, it's so sweet. My darling Mary, I hope you won't think I'm silly, but I keep your picture on the wall of my bedroom. I didn't want my mother to know who I'm in love with, so I took a pencil and drew a mustache and a derby hat on you. <laughs> I think 
I fooled my mother because now she's in love with you, too. <laughs> well, I'll be darned. And look how he finishes. I love you madly and passionately and will never forget the kiss you gave me when I took you home. Thanking you in advance for your next shipment, I remain... <laughs> <laughs> I remain yours truly, Dennis Day. Well, that's the cutest letter I've ever heard. Let's see that. Mary, why has Dennis got the stamp pinned on the envelope? Oh, that. <laughs> he says that ever since he fell in love with me, he won't let anything else touch his lips. <laughs> well, gee, he must be hungry by this time. That's her. Shh. Quiet. Here he comes now. Hello, everybody. Hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Don. Hiya, kid. Hello, Phil. Hello, Dennis. Dennis, I said hello. Mary, don't make it so obvious. <laughs> obvious? All I said was hello. I know, but look how you're trembling. <laughs> Dennis, you're imagining things. She's not trembling. What are you trying to do, break us up? <laughs> no, I'm not trying to break you up. Hey, Mary, come here a minute, will you? I want to look at you. All right, Dennis. Gee, gosh... Well, what is it, Dennis? You look so much better without a mustache. <laughs> Dennis, what about the derby? No, thanks. I'm not hungry. <laughs> I didn't mean that. But anyway, kid, I know how you feel. When you're in love, everything is bright and sunny and cheerful. Your heart overflows with goodness. You feel nice towards everybody. Say, hey, Jackson, did you hear about Fred Allen being voted the best comedian on the air? <laughs> there will be a short pause while Dr. Jekyll becomes Mr. Hyde. <laughs> Mary, it doesn't bother me at all. Anyway, I read about Fame Magazine selecting Allen as the greatest comedian on radio. What a choice. What's the matter with you, Jackson? Every time Fred Allen gets an award, you get mad about it. Two years ago, you got mad because they put his picture on the cover of Time. Bill, Fred's face was on the cover of Look. It was on the cover of Time. It was on the cover of Look. His face represented Time. <laughs> that burns me up. All right, all right. So he's not as pretty as I am. But you've got to admit he's got a great radio show. Some great show. Comes on and jabbers for a few minutes, then he calls... Portland, 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 Portland. For the first four years, people thought he was a conductor on a Greyhound bus. <laughs> Come on, Dennis, let's have your song. Okay. That was... That was... I Love You for Sentimental Reasons, sung by Dennis Day, and very good, Dennis. Yes, Dennis, I've never heard you sing so well. That's because I'm in love. <laughs> With me? It ain't your sister, babe. woo, woo! Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Dennis, behave yourself. Don, Don, you're mistaken about Lauren Bacall. She won't be here tonight. Oh, why not? Never mind. We haven't got time to discuss it. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Tell him what happened, Jack. Mary, we've got a program to do. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Anyway, Don, the oh. trouble started after you left the rehearsal yesterday at Jack's house. Jack's house. Jack's house. <laughs> Lauren Bacall hadn't showed up as yet to rehearse a part. And Phil and Dennis and I decided to stick around and play a little gin rummy. So we went in the den and sat down. Say, hey, Jack, who are you and Lauren going to rehearse? In the library. Then we can stay here in the den and play cards, can't we? Yep, that'll, that'll be all right. Rochester, will you bring in a deck of cards, please? Yes, sir. What, shall I, what cards shall I bring? The red backs or the blue backs? Oh, it doesn't make any difference. Yes, it does. The reds are 40 cents, the blues 50. <laughs> Bring them a deck of cards. They won't quibble about the price. Now, come on, Rochester. I want you to go in the library with me and help me get things ready. Yes, sir. Now, Rochester, uh, I want to make a good impression on Miss Bacall, so see that there's a nice fire burning in the fireplace. Move the uh, divan so it'll be nice and cozy in front of the fire. Uh, turn the lights down low, turn on the phonograph, and put on some nice, soft, romantic music. Want me to burn some incense and pan you with a palm leaf? <laughs> No, no, that won't be necessary. Now, let's see. I think these horn-rimmed glasses make me look a little too old. I guess I'll take them off. Oh, boy. 
I wouldn't do that if I were you. Remember what happened the time Miss Ann Sheridan came over to rehearse with you and you took off your glasses? Oh, no, nothing happened. When Miss Sheridan came in, you rushed over to where you thought you saw her, put your arms around the bridge lamp, kissed the parrot, and said, Why, Annie, you bit me! <laughs> That's because it was dark. Now, let's see. Oh, that must be Miss McCall now. Rochester, you answer the door. I want to sit down and make myself look alluring. I mean, relaxed. Uh, there, uh, how do I look? Fine, boss, but aren't you overdoing it with that rose in your teeth? Rochester. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Ramona Benny. <laughs> the rose is for my lapel. Oh, answer, answer the door. Yes, sir. Is Mr. Benny at home? Yes, come right in, Mr. Cole. Oh, uh, Rochester, uh, who is it? Miss Lauren Bacall. Well, Lauren Bacall. <laughs> you were expecting maybe Mrs. Nussbaum? <laughs> uh, Rochester, you can get lost now. Yes. <laughs> well, uh... Come in, Lauren. Uh, this is in flesh a deeter. I mean, indeed, a pleasure. Uh, make, uh, uh, make yourself comfortable. Sit down. No, thanks. I'll just lean here against the door. Gosh, Lauren. Seeing you there reminds me of your first picture, the have and have not. You were leaning against the door, just like that. And then you said your famous line. You mean, if you want anything... Just whistle. Yes. Yes. <laughs> well, Lauren. Lauren. Well, now, let's start rehearsing. Here's your script. We're going to do a sketch based on your picture, to have and have not. You'll play the same part you did in the picture. Okay. Well, let's start. I'll take the uh, first line. <clears throat> oh, wait a minute, Jack. I'm supposed to lean against the door. Oh, yes, yes. I... <laughs> Yes, I, I'm sorry. Well, we'll start again. <clears throat> You're sore at me, aren't you, Slim? Sure, Steve. I'm sore at you. I wanted to get even. I brought that bottle of brandy up here to make you feel cheap. But I'm the one who feels cheap. Well, you've only got yourself to blame, Slim. After all, what did I do? Nothing. What's more, you don't have to do anything. Oh, maybe just whistle. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. No, Slim. I got a better use for my lips. <laughs> Come here and let me kiss you. All right, but first take that rose out of your teeth. <laughs> I'm so sorry, you know. I, I, I meant to put that in my lapel, in my lapel. Now, let's... Now, let's start the, the, let's start the scene over again. <clears throat> you're, uh, you're sore at me, aren't you, Slim? Sure, Steve, I'm sore at you. I wanted to get even. I brought that bottle up here to Who make you... brought what bottle up where? <laughs> Bill. Hello, Curly. Well, St. Peter must have left the gate open and look who fell out. <laughs> Oh, leave a lamp burning in the window, Mother. I may be a little late. Well, ah, oh, yes, there's good news tonight. Yeah. Well, introduce me, Jackson. Introduce me. All right, all right. This is Miss Lauren Bacall. Lauren, this is my colleague, Phil Harris. Well, hoity toity. I'm a colleague now. Yeah. And yeah, I go already. Okay, okay. Now, come on, Lauren. Let's take that kissing scene again. Now, we'll take that kissing scene again. Let's start where I. Hmm, who can that be? I left strict orders not to be disturbed. Mr. Benny, Mr. Humphrey Bogart's at the door. Humphrey Bogart? Oh, Jack, I forgot to tell you. Bogey said he dropped by here and picked me up. You know, he and I are married. I know. Who do you think played the violin at your wedding? <laughs> anyway, he can wait outside. We got a scene to rehearse, and we're going to do it. Uh, hello, baby. Hi, Jack. Uh, look, Humphrey, we're right in the middle of the rehearsal. Oh, that's all right, Jack. Go right ahead. We won't be long, honey. That's all right, baby. You know, Jack, I'm glad to see you again. You're my favorite comedian. I am? Well, that's good. Now, Lauren, <clears throat> I mean, I mean, Miss Bacall. 
Uh, oh, by the way, what should I call you? Lauren or Miss the Call? Mrs. Bogart. <laughs> hmm. Now, let's get on with the rehearsal, Mrs. Bogart. Start with your, uh, starting with your last speech. Huh? Okay. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. No, Slim. I got a better use for my lips. Come here and let me kiss you. <laughs> what a comedian. What a comedian. Look, Humphrey, I'm trying to... Mr. Benny, there's a telephone call for you. Oh. Well, pardon me a minute, folks. I'll be right back. How's it going, baby? Oh, brother. <laughs> yeah, I thought so. Say, uh, baby, I want you to do something. What is it? When you get to kiss him, just put one arm around him and run your other hand through his hair. Why? I want to find out if he really wears one. <laughs> hey, um, what does Benny, what does Benny want to be a great lover for anyway? Well, why shouldn't he? After all, he played a romantic lead and the horn blows at midnight. You saw that, didn't you? Yeah, and they called our last picture the big sleep. <laughs> Oh, um, by the way, what's this sketch you're rehearsing with Benny? To have and have not. We're rehearsing the big scene you and I did in the picture. Oh? Which one of you is playing my part? <laughs> He's coming back. Oh, I'm sorry. I had to answer the phone, but, well, that's the price of fame. Who was it? Wrong number. <laughs> I mean, my, uh, my sponsor called because he sent me the wrong number of tickets to the broadcast. Now, let's uh, get on with rehearsal, Lauren. We'll start with my line. Well, you've only got yourself to blame, Slim. After all, what did I do? Nothing. What's more, you don't have to do anything. Oh, maybe just whistle. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. No, Slim. I got a better use for my lips. Come here and let me kiss you. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Jack. Hold it. You're doing it all wrong. Wrong? Yeah. When you get ready to kiss a girl, you put your arms around her gently, tenderly. What? Yeah, you're not supposed to grab her by the earlobes and pull yourself up. <laughs> oh. Oh, I see. And yeah, now watch me. Come here, baby. Read that line again. Okay. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. No, Slim. I got a better use for my lips. Come here and let me kiss you. Like this. I see you. Humphrey, I get the idea. I get the idea. That's enough, Humphrey. Look, you can do that at home. Look. Humphrey, I'm paying her by the hour. I'm supposed to do that. I, uh, I get the idea now, Bogey. Uh, let you and I take it again, Lauren. Hey, Jack, our gin rummy game's over, so I thought I'd come in here and watch you rehearse. All right, all right, but be quiet. Now, come on, Lauren, start with your line again. Okay. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? <laughs> you just put your lips together and blow. Ah, Slim. I got a better you. <laughs> Come here, Larry. Kiss you. Like this. No, 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 Jack. No, no, you're doing it all wrong. Here, let me show you again. What? I'll do it with Mary this time. Are you ready, Mary? <laughs> Am I ready? I was puckered up when I walked in here. <laughs> but look, Mary isn't even... Come on, Mary. Come on, Mary. You take baby's line. Okay. You know how to whistle, don't you, Steve? You just put your lips together and blow. Oh, no. I've got a better use for my lips. <laughs> Come here and, and let me kiss you. Like this. Bogey, Bogey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute! Wait a minute! What is this? What is this? 
anyway. Step aside, Mary. I want to talk to Mr. Bogart. Yeah, and I want to talk to him, too. Dennis. Say, he's cute. You haven't got a chance, sister. I send all my Coca-Cola tops to Mary. Dennis. Now listen to me, Bogart. I saw you kissing a woman I love, see? And you ain't muscling in on my racket, see? Those lips ain't big enough for the both of us, see? Now get out of here before you get hurt, see? Get out, see? Out, see? Out, see? Out! Dennis! See? Come on, baby, let's get out of here. This guy's tough. Bogart! Lauren! Come back! Dennis! Dennis, I can't believe it. You know what you did? You frightened Humphrey Bogart. Sure. Dennis, what's that you got in your hand? A picture of my mother. Oh, wonder. Jack, now, Warren will never be on my program. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart for appearing on my program tonight. They can currently be seen in their Warner Brothers picture, The Big Sleep. Well, I better rush home now. Oh, taxi, taxi. Oh, taxi. Oh, doorman, get me a taxi, will you? Look, bud, if you want a taxi, just whistle. What? You know how to whistle, don't you? Just put your lips together and blow. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Well, what do you know? It works. <laughs> Program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, again it's Sunday, so let's go out to Beverly Hills to Jack. Wait a minute, every week it's the same thing. Let's go out to Beverly Hills to Jack Benny's house. Why don't we go to somebody else's house for a change? <laughs> yes, why not? Let's go out to the home of uh, of uh, the home of George Burns and Gracie Allen. <laughs> George, what are you doing? Oh, nothing, Gracie. Just reading a book. Oh. The man she was with tried to stop her, but she pushed him aside and staggered across the floor. George, if you're going to sit there reading a book, why don't you take off your shirt? Take off my shirt? Yeah. It's so thrilling the way your muscles bulge when you turn a page. <laughs> Gracie, my muscles don't bulge. You let me read. The man she was with tried to stop her, but she George, pushed... is today Sunday? Yes, yes. The man she was with tried to stop her. I'm glad it is because on Sunday, Jack Benny's on the air, and I wouldn't miss his program for the world. Well, he's on right now. You want to hear him, turn on the radio. Mm, Jack Benny is wonderful. I think he's even funnier than Gene Herschel. <laughs> Gracie, he's on right now. Gene Herschel? No, Jack Benny. Oh. Oh, yes. I wouldn't miss him for the world. Mm. You know, George, if Sunday came around and I didn't listen to Jack Benny's program, I'd kill myself. Gracie, turn on the radio. You can hear him. But if I killed myself, I wouldn't be able to hear the program next Sunday. And, and the program next Sunday would probably be better than the program I killed myself over. <laughs> so that, that's why I make it a point never to miss Jack Benny. Okay, I'll turn it on for you. Oh, George, isn't that wonderful? What's wonderful? The way your muscles bulge when you turn the dial. Gracie. Take off your shirt. Gracie, will you please keep quiet so I can get Jack Benny's program? And, Don, when I walk into the library and I said to Rochester, what are you doing with those goldfish in your hand? What do you think he said to me? I don't know, Jack. What did he say? Well, Rochester looked right in my face and said... Gracie, why did you turn off Jack's program? Well, I wanted to tell you that if you hadn't reminded me that today was Sunday, I would have missed him. <laughs> look, Gracie, you could have found that out for yourself. All you had to do was go out in the kitchen and look at the calendar. The red numbers are Sunday. But, George, on our calendar, all the numbers are red. What? It fell in a bowl of ketchup. <laughs> Well, Gracie, go back into the kitchen, take the calendar out of the ketchup, and wipe it off. It's too late. You ate it for lunch. <laughs> I did? Well, yeah, George Burns, why didn't you tell me you like calendars? I love them. I love them. Now, Gracie, turn on the radio. You turn it on. Gracie, you're the one who wouldn't miss Jack Benny for the world. You turn it on. Hey, you just want to see my muscles bulge. 
Yes, yes. I want to see your muscles, boss. All right. But I'm not going to take my shirt off. <laughs> okay, I'll turn it on. No kidding, Jackson. Did that really happen? Sure, Phil. And when the man got back on his horse, he said, <laughs> he said, that's why umbrellas have ribs in them. <laughs> I thought it was funny. <laughs> Don't be discouraged, Jack. I thought it was funny, too. Gracie, stop talking to the radio. Gracie, why did you turn it off? You were talking to me. I said stop talking to the radio. How do you know the joke was funny? You didn't hear the beginning of it. All you heard was the answer. Well, that's the only part you're supposed to laugh at. Oh, George, you're just jealous because he's so sophisticated and charming. Jack Benny? No, Gene Herschel. <laughs> Gene? Gene Herschel? Where did he come from? Denmark. Everybody knows that. <laughs> Look, if you wouldn't miss Jack Benny for the world, why don't you keep listening? Instead of turning him on and off and on and off and on and off. Oh, Judge, you're cute. Say that again. Yeah, cute. Makes my Adam's apple do tricks, huh? Nah, no. It makes your pivot tooth spin around and fan you. <laughs> Look, Gracie. Hey, quiet, George. I want to listen to Jack Benny. But, Don, you really ought to do something about your weight. Oh, Jack, I'm not so fat. I went on a diet and lost ten pounds. Ten pounds, Don. Ten pounds off of you is like taking one bucket of smog out of Los Angeles. Huh? <laughs> yeah, quiet, quiet, George. I want to hear the end of the joke. <laughs> that was the end of it. Don, Don, when I first hired you 13 years ago, you were thin. And that's the reason I, mean, I can't the understand you, Because George. I wanted to Every time Jack Benny comes down here, he starts talking. We're not you jealous. Know. You're the one who wanted to hear him, and you keep on talking. There you go again. You know I wouldn't miss him for the world. I think Jack Benny is the funniest comedian on the radio. Wait a minute. Go on, Alyssa. I'm going to shut it off. George Burton. Why did you turn off the radio? Because I want to read my book. I just bought it. It's The Razor's Edge. Well, why buy it? You could read it in any barber shop for nothing. Oh. Yes, yes. I never thought of that. Tomorrow, I think I'll go down to the vegetable market and read Strange Fruit. Strange Fruit? We have that book right here. In the library? No, it would spoil it. It's in the icebox. I know. Gene Herschel wrote it. Know him very well. Now, go in the next room and listen to Jack Benny. You bet I will. And I hope he has better luck than he had last week. What do you mean? Well, last week he was expecting Lauren Bacall to be his guest star, and she didn't show up. Oh, yes, that's right. Gracie, will you please let me read my book? Judge, there's only one thing to do. If Jack wanted Lauren Bacall in his program and couldn't have her, well, he can have me. I'll go over to his studio right now, and I'll be Lauren Bacall. George, get your hat. But, Gracie... George, get your hat. Gracie, you can't be Lauren Bacall. Is Lauren pretty? Of course she is. Has she got that come-and-kiss-me big boy look in her eyes? Of course she has. Is she exotic, alluring, and irresistible? Of course she is. George, get your hat. <laughs> that, that was the best man played by Phil Harris and his 18 bridesmaids. And now, and now, hey, ladies Jackson, and gentlemen, just once when I finish the number, can't you say something nice? Not about the music, just about the boy. You don't have to make that crack about the bridesmaid. <laughs> Phil, when 18 men come to a broadcast wearing nightgowns, it calls for a comment. <laughs> Believe me, them ain't nightgowns. Oh, them ain't, huh? <laughs> Phil, Phil, it's not them ain't. If they aren't. Wow. <laughs> Get a load of my little boss. He's gone crepe. Suzette did it. Yeah, you don't even know what a crepe Suzette is. It's a Pasadena tortilla. <laughs> well, well, Bill, for once, you're right. Sure I'm right. Everybody ain't as stupid as you are. Stupid? Well... <laughs> That's a fine thing to say about me, Phil. After all I've done for you. What did you ever do for me? What did I do for you, Phil? Eleven years ago, I happened to be in Memphis, Tennessee. And I dragged you out of a bar, brought you out to Hollywood, put shoes on you. 
stood you in front of 18 musicians, put a stick in your hand, and because you already had the shakes, you thought you were leading them. <laughs> and as a hint for you to wash your hair, somebody put you on a shampoo program. <laughs> what did I ever do for you? So what? So what? Phil, when I picked you up, you didn't even have a ham hock to your name. <laughs> That's the what. Look, Jackson, this may surprise you, but I had one of the greatest orchestras in the country before I ever heard of you. You had a great orchestra. I'll say I did. I was the leader, and I had a man at the piano by the name of a Turby. What? My first fiddle was a guy by the name of Heifetz. Toscanini made my arrangement. Stokowski played the clarinet, and I had a dame singing the blues by the name of Lily Paul. <laughs> well, you really had some great musicians. How come you got rid of them? They couldn't play poker. <laughs> Phil, why don't you go down to Grauman's Chinese and put your head in the cement? <laughs> and keep it there. <laughs> and now, and now, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello. Hello, Dennis. Where have you been? Oh, I was over at the drugstore having a drink. I had a tomato ice cream soda. A what? A tomato ice cream soda. A tomato ice cream soda? Uh-huh. Must taste awful. What's in it? Two scoops of vanilla ice cream, some chocolate syrup, carbonated water, and a cherry. But what about the tomato? She waited on me. Oh, I see. I see, kid. You're, you're making up a little joke. Yeah, I make up jokes all the time. I know, I know. Now, come on, Dennis. Let's have your song. You're not the only comedian in the world, you know. <laughs> Dennis, I, I never said I was. You mean uh, Edgar Bergen, Bob Hope, Jack Haley, Eddie Cantor? And Gene Herschel. <laughs> Dennis, Gene Herschel isn't a comedian. He's on the radio as Dr. Christian. Oh, yeah. Dr. Christian, come down. Dennis. <laughs> Dr. Christian, I'll see you swinging from the highest yard arm in the British... Now, cut that out! <laughs> I'm glad you stopped me. I was getting seasick. <laughs> oh, for now, come on. Come on, Dennis. Let's have your song. Okay. That was... That was You'll Always Be the One I Love by Ticker Freeman. And sung... <laughs> sung by Dennis Day. And it was really swell, Dennis. It couldn't have been sung better. And now... What's wrong with Dick Hames? <laughs> What? There's nothing wrong with Dick Hames. I merely said that you sing beautifully. I suppose Andy Russell is bad, huh? <laughs> Dennis, look, Andy Russell is fine, and so is Dick Hames. They're both great singers. And now... Bing Crosby ought to punch you right in the nose. <laughs> Dennis, be quiet. Now, sit down. And now, and now, ladies and gentlemen, for our... Oh, darn it, more interruptions. Phil, answer the phone for me, will you, please? You answer it, Jackson. It might be a collect call, and I'd love to see your skin roll up. <laughs> Don't be so smart. <laughs> Don, Don, will you answer the phone, please? Oh, I'm checking over the closing commercial. Dennis, will you answer the phone for Jack? Let Gene Herschel do it. Dennis! <laughs> now, stop being so... Oh, never mind. I'll answer. Hello? Hello, Hello Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. <laughs> Rochester. Rochester, what do you want? The dry cleaner is here. Are there any suits you'd like to have cleaned or pressed? Yes, yes. Now, let me see. How about your blue devil pressing one, boss? I'm wearing that. Uh, give him my gray gabardine. I'm wearing that. <laughs> well, look, Rochester, have him press my tan suit. But, boss, you only wore that suit once. That was last week when you were rehearsing with Miss Lauren McCall. I know. She steamed the crease out of it. <laughs> Look, Rochester, have him press that suit and tell him to let the pants out two inches. Better let out more than that, boss. No, no, Rochester. The pants aren't that tight. They're not. Remember what happened last week when you bent over? Rochester. If UCLA could have broke through like you did, they'd have won the game. <laughs> well, okay, okay. Give him my... And give him my full dress suit, too. 
Your full dress suit? Yes, I may as well have it cleaned and pressed for the Academy Award dinner. Oh, so what you're going to get, you could go on a T-shirt. <laughs> Look, Rochester, I'm not expecting an award this year. After all, I didn't make a picture. Maybe they'll give you an award for that. <laughs> oh, stop, and just give my suits to the cleaner. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? Can I have Tuesday afternoon off? I want to go to the races at Santa Anita. But, Rochester, I thought on New Year's Day you made a resolution not to go to the races. I didn't go on New Year's Day. <laughs> Oh. Anyway, the reason I want to go Tuesday is because I got tips on two wonderful horses, Texas Sandman and Namby Pass. Oh, are they are they good horses? Well, Texas Sandman is by shifting sands out of Swamp Queen. Uh-huh. And Namby Pass is by bypass out of Sweet Nancy. <laughs> well, all right, Roger, so you can go, but you can't use my car this time. Take a yellow cab. Oh, a yellow cab? Yeah, that's by rapid transit out of General Motors. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye. I can't understand Rochester. He makes a New Year's resolution not to go to the races and then breaks it. Hey, Jackson, I was at the races just in. I bet on a horse called Fit Shampoo. Fit Shampoo? Yeah, the dandruff came off him so fast, the other horses thought they were snowbound and froze to death. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Harris, when you come home, Alice must think she's in Wonderland. W. <laughs> Look, Wanga, Phil... <laughs> Hey, Mr. Benny. What? I once bet on a horse named Colgate. Dennis, let it go, will you? He came in first, and I got my own show. <laughs> oh, Dennis, when you come home, your mother must think she's in a nut house. Well, at least that makes sense. There. Now, kids, let's not hold up the show anymore, because our sketch tonight is very... Come in. Hello, Jack. Huh? Hello, big boy. You worry through all the baby is here. <laughs> Why, George. Gracie, what's this? Don't be bashful, blue eyes. If you want anything, whistle. <laughs> what? You know how to whistle, don't you? You just put your lips together and boom low. <laughs> Gracie, what? Jack, I'm sorry for this. Oh. But Gracie heard how you didn't get to kiss Lauren Bacall last week, and now she wants to be Lauren Bacall. You keep out of this, Humphrey. Mm. <laughs> now, how about it, kiddo? You'll find me fascinating, so let's fast. But Gracie, I... Wow, that's the kind of a woman I could go for. Say, you're kind of cute, Sonny, but you're too young. Maybe, but I'm plenty hip. Oh. <laughs> I, um, I suppose your father told you how the bees carry pollen from flower to flower on their feet? Yes, he did. Well, I'd advise you to forget that. I tried it, and believe me, it's nothing. <laughs> Look, Gracie, I, I know you meant well in coming over, but I'm trying to do a program. That's right, Gracie. You're embarrassing Jack trying to kiss him. Let's go home. With dry lips? Not on your life. Look, Grace, if you really want to be kissed, why don't you forget about Jackson and grab yourself a hunk of glamour like me? Take it easy, Curly. Take it easy. There's plenty to go around. For goodness sake, Gracie, do you know what you're saying? No, but I love it. Mm -hmm. Now, come on, Jackson. Now, Gracie, you're holding up my program. Anyway, I can't kiss you right under George's nose. You can, but you won't like it that way. Gracie, stop all this nonsense and let's go home. No, George, we can't go now. Lauren Bacall disappointed him, and I'm not going to let him be disappointed again. But Gracie... <gasps> Kiss me, Jack. Gracie! <laughs> Gracie, let me go! Kiss. My hair's standing on end. Yeah, it slipped a little to the side, too. What? Gracie, you ruined my whole radio program. Radio program? Rick, 
George, George, let's hurry home. Why? Well, Jack Denny's on the air, and I wouldn't miss him for the world. <laughs> With Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, let's go out to Jack Benny's house in Beverly Hills, where we find Jack and Phil Harris alone in the library. Well, Jackson, you asked me to come out to your house and see you alone. What's all the mystery? Uh, wait a minute, Phil. I, I want to lock the door. Okay, Jackson, what is it? Uh, just a second, Phil. I want to shut the window. <laughs> all right, all right. You locked the door, closed the window, and drew the blinds. Now, what do you want? Phil, something's got to be done about your orchestra. <laughs> I don't know what, kid, but something. Are you kidding? No, Phil. Look, I'll admit, when we're doing radio shows, I joke about your music. But now we're in my home. Just the two of us. Believe me, I'm serious. Something has got to be done, or else. Now, wait a minute, Jackson. Don't go getting tough with me. If you got any beef, talk to Petrillo. I've already talked to Petrillo, and he's on my side. <laughs> Believe me. On your side? How do you like that? You miss your dues one week and the mother hen starts kicking you out of the nest. <laughs> Look, Phil, after ten years, I don't mind your band. I'm used to it. But listen to these letters I've been getting. Listen to this one. Dear Mr. Benny, I am a poultry farmer. I read in a magazine that music helps the hens lay more eggs. So I put a radio in the hen house. Two weeks ago, I tuned in your program. The hens heard Phil Harris's orchestra. Now they are laying more eggs than ever, but the yolks are green. <laughs> there you are, Phil. What do you think of that? Green yolks? The guy's got something there. You can use them in martinis. <laughs> Please, maestro. Look, here's another one. Now, get this other letter. Dear Mr. Benny... I am a professor of English and literature at Harvard. And for years and years, I have consistently listened to your Sunday presentations. I have found your construction and continuity compact and concise. Your dialogue singularly free of cliches and ponderosities. <laughs> but Mr. Harris's musical ensemble stinks. <laughs> and Phil... This proves he's a high-class professor. He spells stinks with a Y. <laughs> now, those two letters are just samples of the mail that comes in. Every week, I get thousands and thousands and thousands of letters like those. Well, if I'm getting all that mail, I want more dough. <laughs> oh, look, Phil, what I'm trying to tell you is that you better do something about your orchestra. What are you talking about? I got one of the greatest musical aggravations in the country. <laughs> That's aggregation, but for once, you're right. Of course I'm right. You take my boys. They've all got great backgrounds in the music business. Oh, fine. Sure, take Frankie, my guitar player. For seven years, he played first washboard for Spike Jones. Well, he's not playing the washboard now, so tell him to stop strumming his guitar with that box of dust. If he's that close to soap, why doesn't he get some of it on him? And Charlie, your piano player. Now, wait a minute. Don't be talking about Charlie, my piano player. He held a job with Guy Lombardo's orchestra for 12 years. 12 years with Guy Lombardo? Yeah, and he wasn't even a brother. <laughs> Phil, that has nothing to do with it. And believe me, Phil, I'm not picking on you. I'm just trying to arrive at an understanding. Now, Phil, I know you're sensitive. So I'm... <laughs> So I'm talking to you, not as an employer, but as your friend. Now, let's try to... Phil, stop chewing on that ham hock and listen to me. Please. I'm sorry, Jackson. I just happen to have one in my pocket. <laughs> All right, but Phil, I hope we understand each other now. Okay, Jackson. Look, I've got to run along. Do you mind if I go? No, no. Go ahead. 
Phil, I said you can go. What are you waiting for? Well, open the door, Richard. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So long, Jackson. <laughs> Hello, Phil. Oh, hiya, Livy. Come on in the library. I want to hear all about your trip. Where'd you go? Well, Jack, I thought you knew. I went back east to attend my mother and father's wedding anniversary. Really? And how were the Duke and Duchess of Plainfield? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, Jack, they have the cutest way of keeping track of their anniversaries. Each year on their wedding day, Papa snips off a lock of Mama's hair and puts it away. Well, that's awfully sweet. How long have they been married? <laughs> I don't know, but for the last three years, they've been calling Mama Baldy. <laughs> hmm. And, Jack, you should have seen my sister, Babe. She looked beautiful. She wore a strapless evening gown and was really glamorous. You know, Mary, those strapless gowns fascinate me. How do they keep them up? I don't know about the other girl, but Babe uses fish hooks. <laughs> fish hooks? When Babe's out to catch a guy, she ain't kidding. Well, how does she do? Oh, she's got a nice boyfriend now. He's a credit dentist. Oh, you mean one of those dentists who let their patients put them on the installment plan? Yeah, one of his slogans is, Don't sit around and gum your hash just because you're short of cash. <laughs> One of his slogans? You mean he has others? Yeah. His best one is, don't keep your lips closed in sorrow. Smile today and pay tomorrow. <laughs> well, he certainly sounds like the right guy for babe. Yes, and he's very successful, too. He's the one who invented that new lower plate. It bites underwater. <laughs> oh, yes, it's got those new ballpoint teeth. <laughs> By the way, Mary, would you like to have dinner with me? Oh, I can't, Jack. Dennis is coming by to pick me up in a few minutes. He's taking me to a movie. Oh. How come you're going out with Dennis tonight? Well, he called me up in Plainfield for the date. And... Dennis phoned you in Plainfield? Long distance? Yes, long distance. Well, of course he has two shows. <laughs> you know... You know, Mary, I... Hello, Mr. Benny, Mary. Oh, hello, kid. We were just talking about you. I'm ready to go, Dennis. Say, Mr. Benny, ask me what picture we're going to see. What? I say, ask me what picture we're going to see. All right. Well, what picture are you going to see? It's the one about a couple of deers. A couple of deers? The yearling? No, the Dolly Sisters. <laughs> what? <laughs> you sure stepped into that one. Damn it. <laughs> For a big-time comedian, you ain't got that Oxidol sparkle. Then stop with the jokes, will Come you? Come on, Dennis. Let's... I'm going to... Oh, there's the phone again. I wonder who it is this time. Hello? Yes, this is Jack Benny. What? Well. Well, I suppose I could, but of course I'll have to make some arrangements about my picture and radio commitment. Yes, I certainly will think it over. And it was nice of you to consider me. Thanks. Thanks very much. Goodbye. What was that, Jack? They want me to be governor of Georgia. <laughs> Well, go ahead, kids. You can run along now. All right. So long, Jack. So long. Goodbye, Governor. Goodbye, you all. <laughs> Enjoy yourself. Hmm. Da da dee dum dee da dum dum. Sweet Georgia Brown. Dee da da. Oh, Rochester. Yes, boss. What do we got for dinner? One used ham hock. <laughs> One used ham hock. And turnip greens. He had a hole in his other pocket. <laughs> well, wipe the lint off of it. I'm hungry. <laughs> Ah, that was a good dinner, Rochester. Now I think I'll go in the library and get a book. Oh, here's one on the table. But you finished it, boss. I did? Yeah, you called all the pictures in that one. <laughs> oh, yes. Maybe I'll just read one for a change. I'll be in the library, Rochester. Gee, I don't know what to read. Here's a good book. The Great Balsamo by Maurice Zolito. Here's another one. Life in the Swiss Alps by Sam Oliole. <laughs> Here's another one. The Rover Boys on Mulholland Drive. <laughs> Say, they're growing up. Here's one. I Stand Condemned by Maximilian Q. Langley. I Stand Condemned. I think I read that about a year ago. Gee, it was pretty good. Exciting, too. I might as well read it again before I take it back to the library. <laughs> Chapter 1. 
I stand condemned. I'm what you call an average citizen. I come from a little town in the Midwest. Yes, I'm married. I have a lovely wife. And we have three fine boys and a dog. George, Frank, Harry, and Fido. Harry is the dog. (laughs) My life, as the lives of most men, followed a course pointed out by the fickle finger of fate. Most stories start at the beginning. But my story begins at the end. I am occupying a cell in the death row at the state penitentiary. I'm innocent. I'm innocent, I tell you. Let me out of here. Oh, Warden. Warden. Yeah. Warden, you gotta let me out of here. I'm innocent, do you hear? Innocent. And in a few minutes... They're going to execute me. What time do I go to the chair? 5.30. Good. And I won't have to listen to Fred Allen. No. No, what am I saying? Warden. Warden, I tell you, it wasn't my fault. I don't want to go to the electric chair. Now, now, calm down. Our barber's a little rushed today, so I'll shave your head myself. But, Warden... Hey, sit still. I'll start with the scissors. Take it easy around the sideburns, please. Yes, sir. Manicure? No, no, thank you. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me out of here. I don't want to go to the electric chair. I won't leave this room. I can't walk that last mile. Oh, you won't have to. We'll bring the electric chair in here. <laughs> what? We have a long cord, you know. <laughs> but, Warden. Warden, can't you hang me? I'm afraid of the chair. How will they know when I'm dead? We have one of those new electric chairs. You pop up when you're done. (laughs) But, but Warden, Warden, I'm innocent. If you'll only listen to my story, I know you'll believe me. Oh, very well. What is your story? Well, Warden, it goes back a long, long time. I would have led a normal life, except for the fickle finger of fate. The warden listened to my story. I told him how I met the man who was responsible for my undoing. I had just left my office and was going home to my three wonderful children, Manny, Moe, and Jack. We had Manny and Jack and felt that we should have one mo. <laughs> anyway, I was walking down the street when suddenly a figure stepped out of the shadows. He was a tall man with a sort of a square face. He reminded me somewhat of Boris Karloff. But his voice was so pleasant when he tapped me on the shoulder and said... Pardon me, please, but may I trouble you for a match? A match? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have one, but I'll... I'll let you use my cigarette lighter. Thank you. You're very kind. Hey, you! Come back with that lighter! Give me that! All right, all right. Here's your lighter. But why were you running away? I thought you just wanted to light a cigarette. I do, but my cigarette is home. (laughs) Well, you have no right... Wait a minute. You look so much like Boris Karloff. Thanks. You're looking well yourself. (laughs) Thank you. However, my resemblance to Mr. Karloff is purely physical. For instance, I would never think of going to a cemetery in the black of night... Opening graves and stealing the gold teeth out of dead bodies. Huh? That's... That's dishonest, you know. Yes. Wait wait a minute. You were trying to steal my cigarette lighter, weren't you? No, I wasn't. As a matter of fact, I'd like to buy it. 
I'll give you $20,000 for it. $20,000? Well, I... I don't want to take advantage of you. I'll tell you what. I'll throw in an extra flint. <laughs> Just as I said, you're very kind. Here is the money. A $20,000 bill. Gosh. Well, so long, mister. I hope you enjoy the lighter. Just a moment, please. I also admire your necktie. My necktie! I know it sounds fantastic, but he bought my tie for $17,000. And then he bought my shirt and my shoes and my suit. As I gave him my last stitch of clothing, this mysterious stranger handed me $194,000 and two balloons. <laughs> Having no clothes, I blew up the balloons and danced my way home. <laughs> the next day, I met the same mysterious man for a second time. Again, he gave me fabulous prices for my clothes. And again, I danced my way home. <laughs> On the third day, the same thing happened. I was not only getting richer, but I was dancing that time. <laughs> Our daily meetings were more than mere coincidence. A bond developed between us. Two weeks later, I was sitting in the kitchen having breakfast with my wife and my three lovely children, Minsk, Pinsk, and Busher. <laughs> the mysterious stranger had not yet come downstairs. Yes, he was living with us. Come on, children, finish your breakfast. That's right, children, eat your food. But, Daddy, can't we have milk like we used to? I'm tired of champagne on my grape nuts. <laughs> Oh, you can't have milk. It costs practically nothing. Where's Junior? Oh, he's out in the backyard feeding $20 bills to the cows. Feeding our money to the cows? That's ridiculous. No, it isn't, Pa. We haven't any more bags to keep it in. <laughs> anyway, he's been out there long enough. I'll call him. Junior! Junior, get ready for school. Oh, Daddy, I don't want to go to that new school. I bought it, and you'll go to it. <laughs> now, get ready. You know, darling... Things just haven't been the same since that stranger came to live with us. He frightens me. There's something eerie about him. I've been feeling the same. Shh, quiet. Here he comes now. Yes. As we were talking, he opened the door and walked into the room. <laughs> he was wearing sneakers. <laughs> As I rose from the table, he said... Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Did you... sleep well? Yes, I did. Nah. <laughs> Sit down. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm late for breakfast, but I overslept. I was out at a party last night. A party? Well, how do you feel this morning? Oh, well, have some tomato juice. <laughs> Yes, I'll get you some. You know, I envy you two. A beautiful home. Lovely children. Haven't you any children? No. I married a smudge pot. <laughs> you married a smudge pot? Oh, then you haven't any children. No. But we're lousy with oranges. <laughs> oh. By the way, I don't feel I should live here any longer without paying you rent. How much do you want? Well, I'm, I'm no good at these things. Let's forget it. Oh, but I insist. Would a million dollars a week be enough? Well, with or without meal? <laughs> with meal. That'll be three dollars extra. <laughs> I'll be glad to pay it. Glad? Things like this were happening every day. I had gone money, man. Money, money, money. My wife left me. And so did my three lovely children. Sarah, Toga, and Trump. <laughs> I didn't care. I had my money. I 
I accumulated millions of dollars, which I kept in my shoes. I was now 11 feet sick. I begged the OPA to raise the ceiling. One day, as I was sweeping some loose change under the rug, he came in. Hello, my friend. Look, I have a present for you. A brand new $10,000 bill. A $10,000 bill? Let me have it. Give it to me quick. I gotta have it. All right, but be careful how you handle it. The ink is still wet. Don't worry, I'll... The ink is still wet. Wait a minute. You mean you've been printing this money yourself? Certainly. But doesn't everybody? Oh, so that's it. I must have been blind not to see through this whole scheme. My life is ruined. I lost my wife and my three lovely children. Chico, Pico, and Sepulveda. <laughs> I thought I was rich, but I haven't got a tie or a shirt or a suit. All I got is money, 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 and all counterfeit. You've even got my cigarette lighter, and I, like a fool, threw in an extra flip. Yes, you are a fool. Do you think I'd really pay you $17,000 for a necktie? $22,000 for your button shoes? Now, wait a minute. Yes, you are a fool. Do you think I'd give you $500 for a dinner when I can get the same thing at Ciro's for $400? Ciro! <laughs> of course that money was counterfeit. And those balloons you gave me weren't any good either. They broke on the sunset bus and embarrassed me. So all this time, you've been nothing but a counterfeiter. Well, what's the difference? We can still do business. I can print the money and you can get rid of it for me. Never, never, never. I'll kill you for it. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill you. Oh, get your hands off my throat. Take them away. Take them away. Don't kill me. I'll give you back your clothes. Hey, clothes, what good are they now? You had the pants lengthened and the coat that up. You even lost the string out of my pajamas. Please, please, please stop choking me. Stop choking me. Oh, why must I always die in the end? There. There. Yes. I killed him. And as I finished telling my story, the warden looked at me and said, It's 5.30, shall we go? <laughs> and so... As I walked through the little green door, I thought of my three lovely children, Finger, Fickle, and Clyde. <laughs> I stand condemned. I want to thank Boris Karloff for appearing here tonight, and he can currently be seen in his latest RKO picture, Bedlam. Good night, folks. The Jack Benny Program with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I present to you our Master of Ceremonies, that dignified star of stage, screen, and radio, John Benny. Thank you very much. Hello again. This is John Benny talking. And, John, that introduction was just what I wanted. Thanks for your cooperation. You're perfectly welcome. But why, after all these years, do you want to change your name from Jack to John? Well, because I feel that the name John is much more dignified for a dramatic actor. Dramatic actor? Certainly, Mary. Last week on my program, I starred in I Stand Condemned. The week before that, I did a dramatic part with the Screen Guild player. Oh, yes, I heard that. What'd you think of my acting? You stand condemned. <laughs> well, that's a natural reaction from one whose talents spring from the stocking counter at the May Company. <laughs> anyway, I... But I agree with Don. There's no reason for changing your name. Mary, I like the name John because it'll keep people from calling me Jackson and Jackie Boy. Imagine them calling me Jackie Boy. I'm not a kid anymore. You know, I'm nearing 37. Coming around again, eh? <laughs> yes, I was born in a Studebaker. 
That's why I wear glasses on the back of my head, too. <laughs> anyway, remember, kids, the name is John, and that settled it. Well, I think the whole thing is silly. Whether it's John Benny or Jack Benny, I don't see any difference, because, after all, Jack is a nickname for John. That's exactly what I'm getting at. Nicknames have no dignity. For instance, how would it sound if Charles Boyer made passionate love to a girl like this? Come with me to the casbah. Kiss me. It is your lover, Chuck. <laughs> Chuck. I mean, what girl would kiss Boyer if his name was Chuck? I'd kiss him if his name was Hoffenpfeffer. <laughs> all right, all right. Say, Don. I'd kiss him if his name was Handelmeyer. Mary. Say, Don. I'd kiss him if his name was Thistle Winner. <laughs> Mary, put down that telephone book. Why do you always have... Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, oh, by the way, Dennis, from now on, you'll notice that all of your checks will be signed, John Benny. Who's he? <laughs> Me. That's right, Dennis. Jack changed his name to John because it makes him feel more important. And I also told Phil to stop calling me Jack. Hey, Mr. Benny, now that I have two shows, maybe I should change my name. Well, possibly. I, I think when a man reaches a certain point in show business, he, he should acquire a new name and it should be dignified. Gee, that sounds good. What? Dennis Dignified Day. <laughs> no, no, Dennis. Look, your last name Day is all right, but it's, it's your first name that's important. Oh. You see, it should be either dignified or at least something that commands respect. Mother's Day? <laughs> no, no, no. Forget it. Now, kids, I want everybody... How about Groundhog Day? No! <laughs> I don't care what name you take, just so you call me John. Now, kids, I want everybody's attention. For tonight's dramatic offering, we're going to do our version of that popular motion picture, Margie. And since we need as many actors as possible, I asked Rochester to come down and help us out. So as soon as he hello, gets... Hello, kids. Sorry I'm late, but I was hell up in traffic. Oh, hello, Phil. Hiya, Johnson. <laughs> Johnson? Well, that's what you wanted, ain't it? You wanted to get yourself a hunk of dignity, so I'm digging you, John. <laughs> Phil, Phil, by dignity, look, maestro, look, by dignity, <laughs> Phil, by dignity, I meant a name that has class. Well, what's wrong with Johnson? Well, Johnson has no polish. What's Trevor McGee and Molly selling, hotcakes? <laughs> oh, boy, am I sorry I started this. No, no, Jonathan. Oh, Jonathan, don't say that. Huh? You know, I think you got something there. What? Well, I don't like my first name either. Phil Harris. It ain't got no class. What are you going to change it to? McGregor Harris. Yeah. <laughs> McGregor? That's a Scotch name. Phil, you haven't got any Scotch in... Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> How stupid of me. <laughs> You're four-fifth Scotch and one-fifth chaser. <laughs> Your name should be Paul Harris. <laughs> Anyway, kids, I'm going to have dignity on this program if I have... Hello? Hello, Mr. Davis. Port Chester. <laughs> oh. oh, you've been listening to the program. Hey, Rochester, why aren't you at the studio? You're going to be, you're going to be in the sketch. Well, while I was driving down, I got hungry, so I put the car in the parking lot. Uh-huh. And when I got back, the man wanted to buy the car. Oh. Well, I hope you told him my price was $1,000. Uh-huh, but he told me that the used car market has dropped some in the last few days. Oh. Well, what did he offer you? Seven fifty. Well, that, that isn't so bad. You ought to see where the decimal point is. <laughs> what? $7.50 for my car? Grab it fast, boss. I'm coming to the Irish money and he ain't smiling. <laughs> Well, I don't care if he's smiling or not, offering $7.50 for my car. Why, the steering wheel is worth more than that. We ain't got one. <laughs> no steering wheel? Then how'd you get the car downtown? Same old way. Last suit, the sunset bus. <laughs> now, stop that. And listen, Rochester, I want to get a good price for that car. It has a wonderful motor. Oh, come now, boss. That motor was old when you took it out of the washing machine. 
Well, what's the difference? It runs, doesn't it? Yeah, but when you put it in reverse, the exhaust pipe spits buttons. <laughs> Well, look, Rochester, you tell this fellow that if he wants to buy my car, he can have it for a thousand dollars and not a cent less. Okay, just a minute. Hmm. Imagine offering me seven dollars and a half for my car. In wonderful condition. Still has the original rubber on the windshield wiper. <laughs> I wouldn't sell that. Oh, for it. Yes? The man said he'll give you nine dollars for the car if you'll throw in the last two. <laughs> what? Ten fifty if you'll teach him how to use it. Roger, sir, I'm not giving lasso lessons. And the idea of that man offering me $9 for that car. He must be crazy. Well, let's take advantage of it. <laughs> I'm not selling it for that kind of money. Now hurry over to the studio. Okay. Now come on, Dennis. Let's have your song. What are you going to sing? Oh, I'm going to introduce a brand new song that's never been done before. It's called Falling in Love is Easy. Well, that's a catchy title. It was written by two members of your staff, Robert Ballin and Sam Perrin. Well, what do you know about that? Say, Dennis, if you sing this, what do you get out of it? What do I get out of it? They already gave me a check for 50,000 pilardos. <laughs> pilardos? Dennis, we don't have any money like that in this country. I know, but if we ever do, I'll be rich. <laughs> oh, yeah, I knew you'd put it over on them. Come on, let's hear it. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight... We are going to offer our version of Daryl F. Zanish, 20th Century Fox, nostalgic production, Margie. Now, Mary, you're going to be Margie, and I'm going to be your school teacher, the man you fall in love with and eventually marry. I can hardly wait. Hmm. The time is the present, and the opening scene is where Margie and her husband, her former school teacher, are at home looking over the family album. My little Margie. I'm always thinking of you, Margie. I'll tell the world I love you. Don't forget your promise to me. I have all a home and and everything for... Margie? Oh, Margie, what are you doing? Well, I'm just looking over some of these old pictures in my album. Most of these were taken way back when I was in high school. Oh, yeah. Say, I never saw that picture before. Who's this young fella? Oh, him. He was my first daddy boyfriend. His name was Tommy Manville. <laughs> Tommy Manville? How come you broke up? He told me he wasn't the marrying kind. Oh. Hey, look at this picture. It was taken at the senior class picnic at Lake Wanapahooka Makapuka in the Pines. <laughs> Doggone, I always have a tough time pronouncing Pines. <laughs> Gosh, I'll never forget that picnic. That was the day you fell into the lake and I rescued you. And that led to my proposing to you, Margie. Yeah. You know, Paul, I have a confession to make. I really didn't fall in the lake. I jumped in on purpose. Well, I have a confession to make, too. I didn't jump in after you. Somebody pushed me. (laughs) (laughs) Say, more. More. Here comes our son, Donald. Yes. You know, Pa, he's grown up and will be leaving here soon, and I think it's time you had a man-to-man talk with him. I think you're right, Ma. Come here, son. Yes, Daddy. (laughs) You know, son, Ma and I were just looking through the family album. Here's a picture of you when you were a baby. Three weeks old. Gee, I was cute, wasn't I? Yeah. You only weighed 160 pounds, then. (laughs) Just look at you laying there on that bear-skin rug. You killed the bear when you laid on it. That's right. Say, Daddy, when did you and Mommy fall in love with each other? Well, I was a school teacher, and she was one of my pupils. That's right, son. I guess I first realized I was in love with your father just before I graduated from high school. I was walking to school with my best friend, Sarah Sauerbrocken. Marty, you've been my inspiration. Days are never blue. After all is said and done, there is really only one more. Margie! Uh, what is it, Sarah? What do you think of our new teacher? Oh, I think he's the cat's pajamas. Really? Yeah, he has the most beautiful blue eyes. Oh, well, how do you know his eyes are blue? The other day I caught him with his glasses down. <laughs> <laughs> to me, he doesn't appeal. I go for Rudolph Valentino. Say, Sarah, did you see Rudolph Valentino on the cheek? 
Then I, Josh, when he went into his tent and took off his turban, I thought I'd sing. <laughs> and the sheets of air of me, your love belongs to me, dear he. <laughs> that reminds me, sir, when are you going to have your adenoids removed? <laughs> I'm afraid to. It might louse up my singing. <laughs> yeah. Say, Margie, are you really in love with the teacher? Uh-huh. Yesterday, he made me stay after school. Why? Well, while he was out of the room, I drew a picture of him on the blackboard. Gosh, I made him look handsome. Well, why'd he get sore? Well, while I was drawing the picture, I didn't know where to draw his hand, so I put it on his hip. <laughs> you know, Sarah. Oh, there's the bell. Let's hurry. Good day, good day. Dear old golden old day. Greeting and riding and rest my face. Walk to the tune of my victory stick. You are my queen in Calico. I was a bad for barefoot bow. You rode on my sleigh. I love you, Joe. When we were a couple of kids. Good morning, children. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, children, be seated. And now, children, now, children, I shall call the roll. Dennis Day. Here. Margie Livingston. Present. Betty Sullivan. Here, teacher. Philip Harris. Here, teacher, and I brought you a ham hock. <laughs> Thank you. Sarah Powerbrotten. Here, teacher. Humphrey Bogart. <laughs> You miss me and sit down. <laughs> Freddie Allen. Well, I'm here, teacher. <laughs> Forty teachers in this school. He has to be in my class. <laughs> Titus Moody. Howdy, bub. <laughs> Melvin Blank. Ugga, ugga, boo, ugga, boo, boo, ugga. <laughs> Melvin, are you present? Uh, yes, teacher, I'm pleased, pre- I'm pleased, pre- I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> very well. <laughs> very well, very well. Frankie Nelson. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. Well, I'm happy to see all your bright and smiling faces. Now, Dennis Day, you may erase the blackboard. Yes, teacher. I will start off with our geography lesson, children. The first lesson will be... Dennis, stop erasing the blackboard with that and put it back on my head. (laughs) I'm sorry, teacher. I found it on the floor. Hmm. Now, let's get on with the geography lesson. Freddie Allen, where's Portland? Home with her mother. Portland's in Oregon. So is her mother. Now, the next question is, the next question is, where is Amsterdam? Ooh, what he said. <laughs> Dennis Day, don't be silly. I'll ask another question. Where is Helsinki? That's even worse. <laughs> Dennis Day, be quiet. I'm trying to teach you something. Now, Philip Harris, where is Bally Bally? Right below your chesty chesty. <laughs> Never mind that. Now, children, let's go to our history lesson. Frankie Nelson. Yes. Frankie, why did George Washington throw a dollar across the Potomac? I knew that would aggravate you. <laughs> Frankie Nelson, you come here and stand up in front of my desk. I want to talk to you. Now, the next time I ask you a question, I don't want any more of that smart Alec talk. And if you do that again, I'm going to... Stop breathing on my dunce cap. <laughs> Go sit down. Now to continue <laughs> with our... <laughs> Quiet. Oh, Quiet. <laughs> What's all that giggling about? I saw them, teacher. Philip Harris is pinching Sarah Sauerbrot, and Philip Harris is pinching Sarah Sauerbrot. Pinching? Philip, you must stop annoying Sarah. Who's annoyed? I like him. <laughs> <laughs> now back to our history lesson. In medieval times, they used to have many tortures. Can anyone describe some of them? Dennis had his hand up first. The worst torture of all was the rat. 
That's correct. Now, can you describe how the rack works? Yes, teacher. The rack was a big wheel, and they put a man on it and tie his hands at one end and his feet at the other. Uh-huh. And then they turn the rack and would stretch his spine and stretch it and stretch it till finally... Boing! <laughs> a rather odd way of describing it, but you're right. Now, children, it's time for the pre-graduation debate. The subject will be resolved that the salary of the President of the United States should not be increased. Margie Livingston will take the affirmative, Dennis Day the negative. Margie will speak first. <coughs> Learned teacher, fellow students, and my most worthy opponent. I contend that the president should not receive any greater compensation for the following reasons. The presidency of the United States is the highest elective office in the world. And since the office is one of honor, dignity, and prestige, it should not be contaminated by anything so mundane as money. Is that right, teacher? Well... I thank you. <laughs> and now, her opponent, Dennis Day. Learn it, teacher. Fellow students, and my worthy opponent, Margie. <laughs> Dennis, I believe that the president's salary should be increased. Wouldn't it be a fine state of affairs if the president didn't have enough money to pay his rent and he was evicted? I can just see the poor man standing on the steps of the White House yelling, Open the door, Richard! <laughs> good, good. <laughs> money to meet all the bills he contracts while in the White House. Yes, fellow students, remember the main. What? And in conclusion, I want to repeat those famous words of Kilroy, I was here. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Man. Well, children, children, school is over. Everybody can go home but Margie. <laughs> Margie, I kept you after school because it gives me great pleasure to tell you that you won the debate and you win first prize. Oh, that's wonderful, teacher. What is the first prize? Me. <laughs> Come on, Margie. I'll walk home with you. My little Margie, I'm always thinking of you, Margie. I'll tell the world I love you. Yes, son. That's how your mother and I got married. <laughs> What are you laughing at, Mommy? Son, you wouldn't have been here if Dennis had won that debate. <laughs> That's right, son. <laughs> the Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, yours truly, Don Wilson, and our guest stars, Victor Moore, Peter Lynn Hayes, and Frank Capra. Well, if it isn't yours truly, Don Wilson. Hello, Rochester. Is Mr. Benny in? No, Mr. Benny took Miss Livingston to the movies. Oh, well, when he comes back, uh, will you tell him that, say, Rochester, did you bake a cake or something? I, I smell melted butter. Oh, that. Well, you see, every time Mr. Benny goes to the movies, I make him a bag of popcorn. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Why doesn't he buy it at the theater? With butter and everything, it must cost more to make your popcorn at home. Theoretically, yes, but actually, no. Uh, what do you mean? Well, I make two bags, and he sells one of them to Miss Livingston. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, uh, in that way, you break even. Break even? Since the OPA went off, we're showing a profit. <laughs> But, Rochester, don't you take a loss on the colonels that don't pop? Mr. Benny will pop them if he has to take them to a blast furnace. <laughs> well, as long as Jack isn't home, I think I'll run along. If you care to wait, he ought to be back any minute now. They went to the neighborhood theater. Gosh, Jack, I'm sure glad you took me to see It's a Wonderful Life. I think it's a marvelous picture. Yeah, yeah. I thought the direction was great. Jimmy Stewart was sensational. Yeah, sensational, sensational. Jimmy gave that part just what it needed. I thought his acting was superb. All right, so his acting was superb. He's supposed to be a great actor. 
That's what he got paid for. Well, Jack, I saw your last picture. I returned the money. <laughs> so don't be so smart. Anyway, Mary, don't get me wrong. I like the picture. It's a wonderful life, but it's awfully hard to believe that part where Jimmy Stewart's angel comes down and shows him what would have happened if he hadn't been born. I don't know. It's too fantastic. Oh, you've been mad at pictures ever since they put out bank nights. I have not. It's just that I don't... Oh, Jack, let's stop and look in this jewelry window. Okay. Gee, what gorgeous jewelry they have here. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, Jack. What? Look at that beautiful engagement ring. Mary, are you hinting? Uh Uh-huh. Well, it won't do you any good. I'll never wear it. (laughs) Come on, Mary, let's go. No, I want to look at all these things in the window. Okay, okay. Oh, Martha. What is it, Emily? Isn't that Jack Benny standing over there? Well, I declare. My, but he's handsome. <laughs> Every time I see him, I get weak and wobbly all over. <laughs> oh, Martha. It's the truth, Emily. He really sends me. <laughs> and if I was 20 years younger, I'd go. <laughs> Emily, who's that girl with Mr. Denny? Why, that's Mary Livingston. Hmm. Look how tight she's holding on to his arm. I'd like to go over and pull her hair out. Oh, <laughs> stop being so irritable. You've been acting like this ever since Van Johnson got married. <laughs> you should talk, Emily. You broke your baseball bat when Lippy married Lorraine. <laughs> Anyway, I think Jack Benny is quiet. Here they come. Hello, Mr. Benny. Well, well, hello there. Is it rather late for you girls to be out? (laughs) Come on, Mary. Let's go. Gee, Mary, Wilshire Boulevard looks beautiful at night, doesn't it? Yeah, all the light and... Say, Jack, isn't that Frank Capra? Who? Frank Capra, the man who directed the picture we just saw. It's a wonderful light. Yes, it is. Hello, Frank. Hello, Jack. Mary? (laughs) Well, well, this is a coincidence, Frank. We just came from seeing your picture. Really? I go to that theater every day. You, you go to see your picture every day? No, I just go for the newsreel. I love to hear the governors of Georgia talk. <laughs> oh, oh. Mr. Capra, I want to congratulate you on your direction of It's a Wonderful Life. I thought it was great. Thank you, Mary. How'd you like it, Jack? Oh, I thought it was fine, Frank, but that part about the guardian angel was just a little too unbelievable. Well, Jack, in the picture I didn't try to show what did happen. I tried to show what could happen if someone had never been born. I know, but... For example, uh, what do you think would have happened if you'd never been born? Well... There'd be a lot more money in circulation. <laughs> Mary, stop. But all in all, Frank, I did think it was a very entertaining picture. I'm glad you enjoyed it, Jack. Well, I have to run along now. Oh, just a minute, Frank. I'm glad we ran into each other because I've been wanting to talk to you about a picture for me. For you? <laughs> Uh, you see, the studios have all been after me, but I thought that you, with your great insight into human nature, might better capture my personality. Jack, I'm late already. I, uh, I Think uh... of it, Frank. Think of it. Frank Capra presents Jack Benny in King Lear. Then there's a tremendous blast of trumpet, and the scene opens with me in royal robes walking majestically toward the throne. Can't you just see it, Frank? Can't you? Can't you? Jack, let go of his collar. His face is turning blue. <laughs> oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Wow. Well, smog or no smog, it's good to be breathing again. <laughs> what? Well, so long, King Lear. See you later. Goodbye, Mary. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mary. Frank. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, come on, Mary, I'll walk you home. Yes, Your Majesty. Oh, quiet. <laughs> Rochester! Oh, Rochester! Is that you, boss? Yes. Mr. Wilson dropped by, but I told him you were at the movies and he wouldn't wait. Oh, well, I'll see you tomorrow. Come here a minute and... Rochester, what's that penny on the table? Huh? Oh, while Mr. Wilson was here, he stepped into the bathroom and weighed himself. <laughs> Good. Good. How, much, uh, how much does Mr. Wilson weigh now? I don't know, but you've got a lot of broken tile in the bathroom. <laughs> hmm. Say, boss, how'd you like the picture? It's a Wonderful Life? Oh, very much, Rochester, but a little too fantastic. You know, the angel and everything. I don't know. Say, Rochester... I'm a little sick to my stomach. I'm going to the medicine cabinet and take something. Mm -hmm. There it is. A couple of squalors of this, and I'll feel much better. This ought to fix me up. Oh, darn it, I dropped the glass. Well, I'll just drink a little out of the bottle and... Oh, my goodness. Look at that label. This is iodine. I almost poisoned myself. Oh, boy, am I glad I dropped the glass. What a lucky accident. That was no accident, Jack. Huh? I knocked the glass out of your hand. You knocked the... Wait a minute. How did you get in here? Who are you? I'm your guardian angel. What? My guardian angel? Yes, I've been watching over you all of your life. I've guided you and I've protected you. Guided me? Protected me? Yes, I've governed every move you ever made. Oh, you mean it? you who kept me from spending my money? <laughs> no, you've done pretty well with that yourself. <laughs> But you saved my life, and you don't even know me. Oh, you're wrong, Jack. I know everything about you. Remember when you were seven years old, you broke a window, and you blamed it on your sister, Florence? Yeah. Yes, that's right. And remember when you were ten years old, how proud you were when you put on your first two pairs? <laughs> that, that was for a school play. Well, the play is over. Take it off. <laughs> Say, you... You do know a lot of things about me. Well, Angel, it, it was nice of you to save my life and, and come again sometime. Oh, I can't go yet. Because, you see, I was sent down here to prove something to you. Prove what? I'm going to show you what would have happened if you had never been born. You mean like like what I saw in the picture tonight? Yes. Come with me. No, 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 no. I'm not coming with you. No, I'm afraid. Oh, you're nothing to fear. Come on now, come on. I'm not coming with you. Let go of my arm. Let go of my arm. Rochester! Rochester! Hmm, that's funny. Rochester! You have no Rochester. What do you mean I have no Rochester? You've been my butler for ten years. No, he hasn't. You've never been born. <laughs> you mean, you mean there's no Jack Denny? That's right. Now come. Come with me. Hey, where are we? What are we doing in this department store? This is the May Company. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. And there's Mary behind the stocking counter, like she used to be years ago. What is she doing back here? She never left here. You see, you were never born to take her away. She, she... She looks good. Well, of course, she's been eating regularly. <laughs> oh, this whole thing is crazy. I'm going over to Mary and ask her myself. Oh, Mary! Mary! Yes, sir? What can I do for you? What are you doing behind the stocking counter? Why aren't you on the radio? Well, that's a new approach. They generally ask me why I'm not in pictures. Well, Mary, please, don't you recognize me? Don't you know me? Have you forgotten all about our radio work? What radio work? What work? Are you crazy? What do you do every Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock? I take a bath, do you mind? <laughs> Mary, Ma 
Mary, please listen to me. Will I'll you? thank you not to be so familiar. Please call me by my last name. Okay, okay. Now listen, Miss Livingston. It's Mrs. Clingenpeel. <laughs> Mrs. Herman Clingenpeel. Mrs. You're married? I can't believe just a little while ago you tried to buy me an engagement ring. You can't be married. Well, ask my husband. He's a floor walker. What? Here he comes now. Oh, yes. Mr. Mr. Yes. <laughs> Is this true? Are you two married? Well, if we're not, we certainly dipped the bride and groom program out of a two week honeymoon. <laughs> oh, stop. Mary, this is all a terrible mistake. Angel! Angel, where are you? Just a minute, I'm opening a charge account. <laughs> What's taking you so long? They don't believe my address. <laughs> Never mind that now. Take me out of here. Take me to Dennis Day. He'll know me. All right, Jack. Hold on. Here we go. Angel, what are we doing here in New York City? Uh, don't you recognize this place? This is Studio H in NBC. Oh, yeah. And there's Dennis Day walking up to the microphone. Oh, Dennis! Dennis! Sorry, Pop. No autograph. <laughs> I don't want your autograph. Dennis, don't you recognize me? I'm Jack Benny. Who? Benny. Jack Benny. Listen. Can it be the trees that fill the breeze with rare and magic perfume? I don't know about the perfume, but your singing stinks. <laughs> Angel. Angel, he doesn't even know me. Well, of course he doesn't know you. Jack Benny doesn't exist. Doesn't? You're you still to... waiting to be born. Waiting to be born? That's ridiculous. Look at my hair. It's gray. Yeah, you've been waiting a long time. <laughs> Dennis. Dennis, think of it. I'm Jack Benny, the man you work for. Oh, no, mister, you're wrong. I work for that man over there. The one with the baggy eyes. Where? Thank you, thank you, and welcome to... Hey... What's going on here? I've got a program to do, and I don't need any outside help. Why well, was for... Why? Well, you're Fred Allen. You were expecting maybe Uncle Remus? <laughs> now, wait a minute, Fred. Wait a minute. Don't you pretend you never met me either. I'm sorry. I don't believe I ever had the pleasure. Pleasure? Fred, look at me. I'm Jack Benny. The man you hate. Me? Me hate anybody. Why, everyone knows Fred Allen loves the whole world. I love my writers. I love the NBC vice president and the censors, too. I love the little lads and lassies who ask me for my autograph as they wipe their little noses on my sleeve. <laughs> and believe me, sir, I love you, too. Angel. Angel, there must be something wrong. Fred Allen doesn't hate anybody. Certainly, you weren't born yet. <laughs> Wait a minute, Fred. You and Dennis are just pretending you don't know me. But the rest of your cast will. The rest of my cast? There are no other performers on my program. Just Dennis and myself. Oh, yeah? What about Senator Claghorn and Titus Moody and Ajax Cassidy? Why, I thought everybody knew Dennis plays all those parts. You mean Dennis or Senator Claghorn? I'm from the South, son. I just got back from a party, and I'm in my cup. Dixie, that is. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. And he's Titus Moody? Howdy, bud. <laughs> Dennis, and you play Ajax Cassidy, too? How do you feel playing all those parts? Oh, terrible, 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 terrible. <laughs> and I'm not long for this world. <laughs> Angel, Angel, there must be someone who knows me. I know. Take me to see Don Wilson. He's worked with me for 14 years. He'll remember me. Don's been with me through thick and thick. I mean, thin. <laughs> All right, Jack, I'll take you to see Mr. Wilson. Gee, you're such an obliging angel. Don't you mind taking me from one person to another? No, I get mortal to mortal pay. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Are you convinced, Tom? Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm convinced. Angel, take me back home, please. No, not yet, Jack. There's one more place I'd like to show you. Come. Where are we? What town is this? Nashville, Tennessee. Nashville, Tennessee? Why, well, that's where Phil Harris comes from. Yeah, and this is the nightclub where he works. Phil Harris works in this awful dump? Yes, you see, you weren't born, so you never took him away from here. <laughs> well, well, I'm glad. This is where he belongs. <laughs> let's, let's go in and see him. All right. Follow me right down these stairs. Back with a crummy nightclub. Look at the name of it. The Ruiz Club. What about it? Ruiz fell backwards. It's sore. <laughs> now, that makes very little difference to Mr. Harris. He can't even spell frontlets. <laughs> Come on, Jack. Follow me down these stairs. Wait. Uh, all right. Watch it. Sir. If I go down any farther, I'll get the bend. <laughs> well, I don't like this any more than you do. I'm an angel, and the further down I go, the nearer I get to enemy territory. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess it's just a few more steps down. Here, here we are. Angel. Angel, isn't that awful? Yes, that's why we sent you so much thunder. We're trying to drown him out. Thanks. Well, folks, here I am again, your favorite master of ceremonies, Phil Harris. <laughs> Funny thing happened to me today, folks. Guy walked up to me and said, uh, Mr. Harris, where'd you get that black eye? So I told him it was a birthmark. And he said, a birthmark? And I said, yeah, I got in the wrong birth. <laughs> don't explain it to him, ladies. If you don't get it, just let him suffer. Let him lay there. <laughs> Don't tell him nothing. Well, Phil, Phil Harris. Pardon me, folks. There's an old heckler down here in the front row. Uh, yeah? What do you want, Bob? Phil, look at me. Look at me, Phil. Don't you recognize me? I never saw you before in my life, Buster. But I'm Jack Benny. I'm your boss. What do you mean, boss? I own this joint myself. Lock, stock, and demi John. <laughs> At Barrow. Don't tell me what to keep my bourbon in. <laughs> All right, so you don't work for me, but what does Alice think about you being here? Who? Alice Faye, your wife. Alice Faye, the moving picture star, married to me? Yes. Hey, waiter, what's the idea of selling this old gentleman more than one zombie? <laughs> Look, I'm not drunk. Aren't you married to Alice Faye? Of course I ain't. That's my little wife right over there. Hey, baby, come here. I'd like you to meet someone. Any friend of yours is a friend of mine, talent boy. <laughs> well, wait a minute. You, you should know me. You're my girlfriend. You're Gladys Abisco. Gladys Abisco Harris, if you please, and I never went out with you in my life. Look, honey, maybe you went out with a guy on a blind date. I'd never get that blind. <laughs> but you must, you must remember me. Look at me. Look. Come on, Jack. I think you'd better be going again. Well, all right, Angel. But I'm not licked yet. I'll prove to you that I was born. Well, I'll give you one last chance. Where do you want me to take you now? Let's see. I know. Take me to Warner Brothers Studio. They'll know me there. Well, Jack, here we are at the studio. Yeah, and there's the executive officer. Let's go in and see the Warner Brothers. <laughs> see, 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 listen to him laugh. <laughs> listen to him. <laughs> listen to him. <laughs> Why are the Warner Brothers so happy? Because you were never born, so you didn't make the horn blows at midnight. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> Listen to me, Mr. Warner. Listen to me. Stop laughing. Stop laughing. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Where do they go? Where do they... Oh, Angel. Angel. Angel, where are you? Here I am, boss. 
Huh? Oh, hello, Rochester. I rushed in here when I heard a glass crash. Oh, yes, yes. I I just dropped my medicine. Your medicine? The boss that bottle in your hand is iodine. I know, I know. I was just putting it back. Thanks, Rochester. Say, Rochester. Rochester, have you ever had a feeling that there's somebody watching everything you do? You know, somebody who knows every move you make, knows everywhere you go, even when you think he doesn't? Yes, boy. You know who it is? Yes, now we should cut it out. <laughs> I don't mean that. I... Program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll bet you often wondered what happens immediately after a program goes off the air. Well, let's go back to last Sunday. Jack Benny has just finished his broadcast. Okay, Phil, okay, cut it. Cut it, Phil, we're off the air. Well, folks, how did you like the program? Well, I'm... I'm glad you did. Ladies and gentlemen, you were a wonderful audience. Just wonderful. And I'm looking forward to seeing you all here in the studio again. You'll never see me again, bub. <laughs> what? I wouldn't sit through another one of your shows if I was in the front row. Your guest star was Sally Rand, her balloon had a slow leak, and my wife wasn't with me. <laughs> Well, <laughs> look here, uh, look here, mister, you're too fresh. You know, you'll never get tickets to my show again. What tickets? Last night I'm walking down the street, a guy throws a sack over my head, gives me a bump on the noggin, and when I come to, I'm sitting here in the studio. <laughs> Gee, I, I know my producer wants all the seats filled, but I wish he'd stop using that blackjack, you know? Jack, do you mean to say the only way you can get an audience is to have your producer go around hitting people on the head? Well. Gosh, and I always thought before we go on the air that bong, bong, bong were chimes. No. <laughs> no, no, Mary, that's three more coming in. <laughs> Last week, one guy's head was out of tune and loused up the whole network. <laughs> <laughs> but we just... We just give them a light tap on the head. It, it only raises a little bump. Little bump? Yeah. My bump's got snow on it. <laughs> I mean, well, don't blame the weather on me. Anyway, mister, the show is over, so you can go. Okay, okay. This is the last time I pass NBC without a helmet. <laughs> all right, all right. Say, Jackson, uh, I'm going to run along now. Oh, just a minute, Phil. I want to talk to you. What is it this time? Well, Phil, I can see now why that guy and the rest of the audience have no respect for our show. Why? What did I do? Phil, do you have to have that bottle of bourbon sitting on the table right next to you while you're leading the band? Certainly. When I use my hand to give the boys a downbeat, I ain't gonna bring it up empty. <laughs> what? Can I go now, Jackson? The ice in my pocket is melting. Phil, Phil, I can't understand you. Standing out here on the stage in front of an intelligent audience. 350 people with bumps on their heads. <laughs> and you act that way. I can't understand you at all. Nobody can understand me, Jackson. I'm a character. People love me for what I am. For what you are. Phil, that and where elephants go to die are the two unsolved mysteries of the universe. <laughs> Believe me. But look, Phil, Phil, I'm not asking for good music. All I'm asking is that you and your orchestra look dignified. This is a big radio show. Tell your boys to take down that clothesline they got stung across the stage there. That's no clothesline. That's a direct wire to Santa Anita. <laughs> Santa Anita? Now cut that out! <laughs> what a bunch of guys. Phil, look at that new violin that you got sitting there during the whole program wearing a derby. Derby, that's a bump on his head. I have trouble getting people, too. 
That I'm sure of. Oh, for heaven's sake, Jack, why don't you stop picking on Phil? As long as I've been with you, you've had trouble with your orchestra leader. Me? Yeah, I'll never forget how mad you got at Johnny Green when he wanted to put poor clarinet in the orchestra. Well, that's where you're wrong, sister. Even though I was paying for it, I had no objection to Johnny Green adding poor clarinet. I know, but you made him hire one man with a wide mouth. <laughs> well, I thought it would be novel. And oh boy, what George Olson went through with you. He even took a swing at you. So what? I was plenty fast, wasn't I? I'll say you were fast. By the time Olson took off his coat and rolled up his sleeves, you ran out of the building, took an eye test, and came back wearing a pair of glasses. <laughs> oh, Mary, why do you say things like that? You know very well that I try to help everybody on my program. Some help. He even cut my song out today. Believe me, Mary. People ought to know what I go through just to put on a show. He'd like to cut my song out every week. You know, Mary, there's a lot more to radio program. I mean, than just talking into a microphone. If my mother was here, she'd punch him right in the nose. <laughs> what? Glasses or no glasses. Dennis, what are you mumbling about? What? Oh, hello, Mr. Benny. Hello, hello. Gee, what a coincidence. I was just talking about you. I know, I heard you. What's wrong? You cut my song out today. Oh, oh, well, I'm sorry, kid. I had to do it because of time. But you can do the song next week. How do you know you'll like it? You didn't even hear it. Well, all right. Let's hear it now. Okay. Huh? Well, come on. What? I say, pardon me, Mr. Benny. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Kitzel. Hello. Oh, ho, ho, hold it a minute, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were never going to get here. <laughs> I was going to do half of last week's show over again. <laughs> the part that was good. But uh, hold it a minute, Dennis. Look, if you came to see my show, Mr. Kitzel, you're a little late. You know, we just we just went off the air. Oh, that's all right. I was sitting in my car. Well, did you like the program? Did I like your program? Oh, oh, oh. I missed it. You I missed, missed it? it. Oh, yes. oh, I see. <laughs> but, but I was in here to see your show last week. Good. Where'd you get the ticket? Who needs tickets? I was nonchalantly walking down the street when all of a sudden somebody threw a sack over me. I got a bump on my head. And the next thing I knew, somebody is whispering in my ear, Welcome to the NBC. <laughs> well, I'm sorry you missed the program today, but maybe you can come back next week. Huh? I'll try. Uh, by the way, Mr. Benny, if it wouldn't be too much trouble, will you please give me an autograph for my nephew? Your nephew? Yes, he's been in the army four years and he's visiting me from Oahu. Oh, from uh, Honolulu, Oahu? No, Cleveland, Oahu. <laughs> That's Ohio, Ohio. Oh, yes. Anyway, here you are, Mr. Kitzel. Here's, here's my autograph. Thank you. You're welcome. Goodbye, Mr. Kitzel. Goodbye. Try to get here earlier next time. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, let's have your song. I want to... That, uh, that was a swell song, a swell song, Dennis. Very, very good. Come on, Mary, I'll take you home now. Okay. Will you drop me off on the way, Mr. Benny? Sure, kid, sure. Come on, let's go. You know, Dennis, that certainly was a swell number, the anniversary song. Would you like to sing it at my birthday party next week? Sure, Mr. Benny. How old are you going to be? 50. 38. <laughs> Mary, he asked me. I'm, uh, I'm 38, Dennis. Gosh, I'm 26 and I'm worried. Why? Look what can happen to me in just 12 years. <laughs> well, don't worry about it, kid. Everything will be all right. Well, say, kids, before we start for home, let's go in the drugstore here and get a soda. Huh? Okay. Here are three stools here. Let's sit here. All right. Oh, there's that same soda clerk. I can't stand him. Well, my heart didn't go pitter-patter when you came in, Blue Eyes. <laughs> I don't know why he hates me. So just take just take our orders. What have you got? We have sodas, parfaits, split, flip, sundaes, malt, sherbet, orange aid, and Dr. Scholl's foot pads. <laughs> What are the Dr. Scholl's foot pads for? For our ice cream corns. I knew you'd ask me. <laughs> oh, brother, I'd like to point him out to my producer. Waiter, give me a chocolate soda. Uh, yes, ma'am. 
Uh, what about you, Dennis? Well, give me a banana split. I hate them, but I've got to have something expensive now that I've got my own show. <laughs> oh, fine. And what are you going to have, Headless Valley? <laughs> Look, Clark, why is it I can... Oh, Jack, let it go. Just give me your order. Okay, give me a vanilla ice cream soda. Say, Jack, have you ever seen one of those soda clerks who can throw the ice cream up in the air and catch it in the glass? I can do that. You can? Certainly. Watch this. <laughs> Whoop, miss. Sorry. <laughs> uh, where did it go? Don't look now, but you got a toupee a la mode. <laughs> what? You mean that scoop of ice cream is on my head? Waiter, do something about it. All right, all right. Hmm. What's taking you so long? I'm putting a cherry on top. <laughs> a cherry? Would you mind sitting in our window a couple of days? <laughs> No, I'm not making any personal appearances this year. Okay, here you drink, folks. I don't know why it is I always have to run into him. How's your soda, Mary? Well. Dennis, don't eat your banana split so fast. I want to finish it before I get sick. <laughs> That's the silliest thing I ever heard. You know, Mary, this vanilla soda is very good. Mine was, too. Well, I'm all finished. Me, too. Uh, you're through with your soda, aren't you, Jack? Just a minute, there's a little left at the bottom. I've only got one show. Oh, Jack, come on. Just a minute. If you strike oil, the glass belongs to me. <laughs> Never mind. How much is the check, sir? Sixty-five cents. No, 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 Dennis. I'll pay for it. No, no, Mr. Benny. I'll pay for it. No, 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 Dennis. Let me pay for it. Careful, Jack. You may take you up on that. <laughs> huh? Remember me? I'm your guardian angel. I was here to stop you from paying this check. Oh, yes. Yeah, you kept me from drinking that iodine last week. Yes, and now I'm saving you from a fate worse than death. What? I've gotten you out of situations like this many times before. You have? Oh, yes. Remember that night in Ciro's when you were having dinner with all those movie stars? Uh-huh. Well, it was I who took the check away from you and gave it to Margaret O'Brien. <laughs> Gee, and I, I thought the wind did that, huh? But, but why are you always trying to save my money for me, Angel? Well, you see, we angels need money, too. You do? Yes, and we figured if anybody would find a way to take it with them, it would be you. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, by the way, Jack, I wish you'd stop telling everybody you're only 38 years old. But why, Angel? Why? Well, every time you tell a little fib, it thunders up where we are. Oh. And around your birthday, we can't hear ourselves think. <laughs> really? Yes. Even though your birthday is on St. Valentine's Day, it sounds like the 4th of July. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll try and watch it. You know, sometimes, Angel, I Jack, just... who are you talking to? Huh? Why don't you stop mumbling to yourself? Mary, I... I wasn't mumbling to myself. I... I was talking to my... Oh, you wouldn't believe it anyway. Come on, kids, let's go. There's my car over there. Now, come on, let's get in the car and go, will you? <laughs> Hello, Rochester. Well, hello, boss. What took you so long? Oh, I stopped in the drugstore and I had some ice cream. You must have had a lot. It's coming out on top. <laughs> oh, darn it. I thought he wiped that off. Uh, Rochester, did you hear my program today? Oh, yes. I listened to it with some friends of mine. Well, what do they think of it? Well, we thought it had some nice moments. Uh-huh. But it definitely wasn't the best years of our life. <laughs> 
No, well, I don't care what you and your friends think. That program will cause lots of comments. You should have heard some of them. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, by the way, boss, a couple of telegrams came for you. Thanks. Read them to me, Rochester. This one's from Fred Allen. Fred Allen? What does it say? It says, congratulations on your birthday next Friday. Heard your program tonight and thought it was very bad. Hope you have many more. <laughs> Nice birthday wire to send me. Give me that other one. Here you are. Rochester. Rochester, listen to this. Congratulations, Jack Benny, on your forthcoming birthday. On my special news broadcast at 6.55 tonight, I'm going to pay you a great tribute. Be sure and listen. Signed, H.V. Caltenborn. Rochester, we got to listen to that. Yes, sir. I'm going to call my whole gang and tell them about it. That's right, Mary. H.B. Calton born at 655. He's going to pay me a tribute. I'm not kidding, Phil. At 655, listen to H.B. Calton born. Now, don't forget, Dennis. Be sure to listen to H.B. Calton born at 655. I can what? Oh, your mother said that. Well, anyway, don't forget to listen. <laughs> Yes, Don, I know it's true. He sent me a wire. Calton Board's going to give me a big tribute, six fifty five. Goodbye. I know it sounds impossible, but it's true. Be sure to listen at six fifty five. Rochester, who are you talking to? I don't know. I'm just calling numbers at random. <laughs> good, good. My goodness, look what time it is. Hey, Calton Board must be on now. Turn on the radio. Okay. However, more concessions were exchanged by the United States and Russia in the privacy of United Nations conference room. That's him. That's Caltenborn. It was announced from London that the King and Queen of England were having a very pleasant ocean voyage on their way to South Africa. The light gale marred their trip temporarily, but once again they're sailing on calm seas. <laughs> They can read that stuff in the papers. Get to me. In Beverly Hills, California. That's it. That's it. The mayor announced that the sewer system would have to be overhauled. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. It seems that the pipes are inadequate to carry off the rains that pour in from nearby states. As you know, California has an ordinance against rain. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, the sponsor of the special program. Publishers of the Encyclopedia Britannica would like to bring you a testimonial from a satisfied user. Oh. Here he is, Mr. Clarice Pierpont. Uh, I've been reading the Encyclopedia Britannica continuously now for two years. I know all about the birds and the bees and all that kind of stuff. It even tells in there that Richard wasn't the first one who wouldn't open the door. <laughs> Gee, they got everything in there. Uh, tell me, Mr. Pierpont, when did you buy your set of Encyclopedia Britannica? Uh, I didn't buy it. Uh, I was on information, please, and they hit me over the head with it. Oh, get that over with, will you? Now, back to the news. All over America, we're celebrating National Boy Scout Week. Since 1910, more than 13 and a half million American boys and men have been members. Maybe I'm next to now, ladies and gentlemen, I have a very special announcement to make. Here comes Rochester. That means me. What radio comedian will celebrate this birthday next Friday, February the 14th? It's me. It's me. This comedian, whom we all love and admire, is a very famous butler by the name of Rochester. Say, you're lucky he mentioned you, too. Yeah. Rochester was born in Oakland, California. <laughs> yes, and he attended the Oakland High School. Hmm. After graduation, Rochester went to work in his father's store. What is this? Why, boss, I want to hear it. <laughs> but having no love for business, Rochester decided to leave home, go to work for the Santa Fe Railroad. Rochester, it's all about you. Boss, please. That's their work. Yes, after working for the railroad for five years, Rochester met a great comedian who was traveling from Los Angeles to New York. That's me. That was me. Tell him, Rochester. Tell him. You tell him. You're as close to him as I am. <laughs> what? And the name of this great radio star who discovered Rochester and is celebrating his birthday Friday, February the 14th, is none other than... We're sorry to interrupt, Mr. Calvin Bourne, but here's another news item. What? It is raining in Beverly Hills. <laughs> Now, back to Mr. Calvin Bond. And that 
concludes my special podcast. <laughs> Good night. Turn that off. A match. Imagine sending me a wire about a big tribute. He didn't even mention my name. You know, it's my birthday next Friday, Rochester. Not yours. I know, boss. Uh, by the way, how old are you going to be? 38. <laughs> Gee. Gee, that angel wasn't kidding. What'd you say, boss? Nothing, nothing. I'm going to bed. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the angel on tonight's program was played by that great star, Mr. Victor Moore. And H.B. Caltenborn was impersonated by Ollie O'Toole. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, during the last war, the chief hope of our enemies was to divide the United States along racial and religious lines and thereby conquer us. Let's not spread prejudice. A divided America is a weak America, and we need the same harmony among our various racial and religious groups that was the source of our strength in war. Through our behavior, we encourage the respect of our children and make them better neighbors to all races and religions. Remind them that being good neighbors has helped make our country great and kept her free. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you all tune in next week as I'm going to have a birthday party and invite one of the world's greatest violinists, Mr. Isaac Stern. And I'll also invite Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. I hope you'll all... Ladies and gentlemen, the rain in Beverly Hills has now turned to orange juice. (laughs) Gee, I I wish my swimming pool was empty. Good night, folks. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, last Friday, February 14th, was Jack Benny's birthday. Jack celebrated the occasion with a dinner party at his home. So let's go back to Friday and out to Beverly Hills where we find Mary and Rochester helping out. Uh, Rochester, is Mr. Benny still upstairs? Yes, ma'am. Hmm. And they say women take a long time to get dressed. He's been up there two hours already. Well, with Mr. Benny's physique, dressing isn't so simple. Well, what do you mean? By the time he pulls in what sticks out and pans out what sinks in, it's a new day, manana. <laughs> <laughs> well, he ought to be down pretty soon. Now, let's see. The table's all set. Oh, by the way, Rochester, are you going to serve hors d'oeuvres? Yes, ma'am. Oh, that reminds me. I'd better take the caviar out of the fridge there. Caviar? Did Mr. Benny buy caviar? Well, uh, yes, indirectly. What do you mean, indirectly? Well, once a week we have fish for dinner. Uh-huh. And before I go to the market, Mr. Benny tells me to pick out a sturgeon with that maternal look. <laughs> well, well, Mary... I'm all dressed. How's everything going? Oh, fine, Jack. And while you were dressing, these telegrams came. I already opened them. You did? Well, read them to me. Okay. Dear Jack, sorry I won't be able to attend your birthday party as I have a touch of flu. Signed, Jane Wyman. Hmm. Too bad. Uh, Here's another. Dear Jack, sorry I won't be able to attend your birthday party as I have a touch of grip. Signed, Claudette Colbert. Gee. Oh, here's another. Mm. Dear Jack, sorry I won't be able to attend your birthday party as I have a touch of distemper, signed Lassie. Uh, well, then we can leave the bone in the soup. Uh, is, uh, is that all? Uh, no, there's one more. Oh, this one's from Leo DeRosa. Oh, Leo, huh? Yeah, he says, uh, Dear Jack, I'm sorry I can't bring my wife to your birthday party as I'm a single man in California. <laughs> Gee, that's a shame. Anyway, I'm sure the party will be a success. I'm having Isaac Stern and Mr. and Mrs. Coleman 
Rochester, what are you doing? I'm putting the champagne labels on the 7-Up. <laughs> I'm not serving that tonight. I'm having still wine. Uh, which do you think would be better, Mary, red or white wine? Oh, I don't know. What are you having for your meat course? Oh, I'm having a Mons de Boeuf, Bordet's Porté. What's that? Hamburger! <laughs> We're not having it as patties. We're having it as meatballs. And, Rochester, when it's time to serve the meatball, do it with a spoon. I mean, don't put three holes in them and roll them down the center of the table. <laughs> now, Mary, after everybody arrives... I wonder who that can be. It's much too early for any of the guests. I'll get it. How do you do, Mr. Benny? My name's Brown. I represent the Lifetime Pot, Pan, and Kettle Company. May I come in for just a minute? Thank you. Look, I... This is my assistant, Joe Davidson. Oh, glad to know you. That goes double. Now, look, fellas... Now, Mr. Benny, as you are one of the leading citizens of Beverly Hills, we have selected you as the man who should have our first post-war demonstration given by the Lifetime Pot, Pan, and Kettle Company. Well, that's very nice, we but I... We plan to show you beyond the shadow of a doubt the superiority of our product over every other competitor in the field. What about it, Joe? That goes double. Look... The look. purpose of our visit is to come into your home and put on a dinner the like of which no king has ever eaten. Look, gentlemen, I'd like to talk to you about this some other time. You see, today is my birthday, and I'm having some guests over for dinner. Did you hear that, Joe? What a coincidence. Mr. Benny, in one hour, we can have ready for you a complete southern course dinner. I know. A prime rib roast, steak fried whole potatoes, carrot peas, and everything to go with it. You'd, you'd fix all that for me? Uh, what will it cost? Not a dime, Mr. Benny, not a dime. This dinner is put on absolutely free through the courtesy of the Lifetime Pop Pan and Kettle Company. Well, well, that sounds reasonable. Yeah. Quiet, Mary. Uh, fellas, what do you get out of it? Mr. Benny, after you have tasted food that's been cooked in a lifetime pot pan or kettle, you'll never want to be without them. Isn't that right, Joe? That goes double. <laughs> Mary. I answered for Joe. He fell asleep. Oh. Well, Mary, what do you think about it? Oh, Jackie, you can't do a thing like this. You're having important guests like Isaac Stern, one of the world's greatest violinists. And Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Cole. There's nothing to worry about. We drive our truck around to the back door, we prepare and cook the food in your kitchen, and your butler will serve it. You see, Mary, there's nothing to it. Go ahead, fellas. The kitchen is yours. Good, good. Mr. Benny, you're a man with a head on your shoulder. That goes double. <laughs> what? Come on, Joe. We got a job. Say, you know, Mary, this is going oh, to... Jack, Benny, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Mary, what are you worried about? We'll be getting the best food possible and nobody will know. After all, nothing's too good for the Coleman. They're probably getting dressed for my birthday party right now. Oh, Ronnie, are you ready yet? In a moment, Benita. What are you doing? I'm just looking through this medical book. Let's see. Arthritis, asthma, athlete's foot, blisters, very berry, croup, colic, erysipelas, fever, gout, goiter, gangrene. Oh, darling, we've used I... all those excuses. This time we'll have to go. <laughs> yes, I guess we'll we'll have Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait. Here's one I overlooked. This temper. No. No, knowing Benny's friends, one of them must have used that. <laughs> uh, by the way, Benita, what birthday is Benny celebrating? He's 38. 38? 38, indeed. Imagine him saying he's only two years older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's stop wasting time and get ready. They're expecting us. I told Mr. Benny we'd be there early. You saw Benny today? Yes, yes. He dropped over here. You remember about two weeks ago he borrowed your fountain pen? Oh, so he finally returned it. No, he came over to fill it. <laughs> Imagine that. When we go on our vacation, we ought to leave a bottle of ink at the back door. Oh, we did that last year, and that Harry's fellow drank it. <laughs> come on, Ronnie, come on, put on your tie. All right, all right. Oh, what a wasted evening this will be. Wish I could stay at home and listen to some good music. By the way, you know that new record I bought? I almost know it by heart. Really? How did it go? Open the door, Richard. <laughs> Richard, open that door. Come on, darling, help me. I'll rap on the table. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Stop being so silly and get dressed. All right. 
You know, as long as we're going to Benny's party, I think I ought to change my shirt. What's wrong with the one you have on? It's clean. Then why change it? <laughs> my dear, have you ever seen Benny eat soup? Soup? He puts a spoon in each hand and goes after it like a mix master. <laughs> All right, darling, let's go. Now, we must find it pleasant. I do hope you remember Mr. Benny's friend. Let's run over them once more. Who is Don Wilson? He's the fat one. Okay. <laughs> and, um, Phil Harris? Uh, the one with the blue lips. Oh, yes, yes. The ink was indelible. <laughs> now, um, Dennis Day. Oh, he's the silly one. That's right. And Mary Livingston? She's the normal one. Good. Now, if she ever got mixed up with that bunch of slameels, I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> come on, Ronnie, come on. We mustn't keep them waiting any longer. <laughs> Jack! Oh, Jack! What is it, Mary? John, Phil, and Dennis just arrived. Oh, hello, fellas. Welcome to my birthday party. Hiya, Jackson. Many happy returns. Hello, Jack, and congratulations. Hello, Mr. Benny. Well, I'm glad you all got here early, kids. And don't forget, Dennis, you're going to sing happy birthday to me, aren't you? Oh, yes, sir. Good. Happy birthday to you. Happy no, birthday. No, no, not now. Not now. I'll tell you when. Oh. Now, come on in. Come on in the other room. Phil! Phil, I can hardly believe my eyes. What's the matter, Jackson? The way you're dressed. Patent leather shoes, white tie and tail. Yeah, and get a load of these white gloves and that cane over my arm. Yeah, but Phil, where'd you get that black eye? I never should have passed that pool room dressed like this. <laughs> well, anyway, Phil, you do look nice. Shall I serve the cocktails now, Mr. Bennett? Not yet, Rochester. We'll wait until every... Don, don't mess around the table. We got everything set just right. I was just admiring it, Jack. It looks wonderful. But what's the idea of having that bed sheet over those four chairs? Those aren't four chairs. What? That's a bench we lifted from the bus stop. Oh. <laughs> Jack, you did Mary, it. it's only for a little while. And anyway, kids, we're going to have a fine dinner and lots of fun at... Well, Dennis. Huh? I noticed you brought a little package to my birthday party. Uh-huh. Ah, uh, Dennis, you don't have to blush. Come on, open it up. Not till we get to the table. What is it? My lunch. <laughs> Say, Jackson, who are you trying to kid with that 38 stuff? You're a lot older than I am, and I'm 35. Happy birthday to you. Dennis, Happy quiet. Birthday. What'd you say, Phil? I said that I'm 35 years old, and I don't even show it. What are you talking about? You've been studying music for over 35 years. He doesn't show that, either. <laughs> I agree with you. 35. When is your birthday, Phil? Well, I was born April the 21st. That comes under the sign of Taurus, the bull. What does that mean? People born under Taurus are usually handsome, popular, and have nice, stable manners. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, Harris, with material like this, you better make money fast. Yes. <laughs> You're not kidding. Taurus the bull. Mary, what were you, what were you born under? Elsie the cow. Elsie the cow? It happened in a boarding house. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, Livia, to think your sister babe nearly took your job away from you. Mary, another joke like that, and you'll be asking babe for her autograph. And this is nothing to kid about. The Zodiac is a very interesting subject. It most certainly is, Jack. You know, I was born under the sign of Leo, the lion. You were? Dennis, what sign were you born under? The picket sign. My mother was out on strike. <laughs> uh, Dennis, stop being silly. And that goes for all of you. And now watch it tonight, will you, kid? You know, I'm having some very important people. Who's all going to be there, Jackson? Only a world-famous violinist, Isaac Stern, and Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Ronald Coleman? Gee, I like the way he talks. If I were king, ah, love, if I were king, what tributary nation would I bring to stoop before your scepter? And to swear allegiance to your lips and eyes and hair. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, you sounded just like him. That was very good. Thank you, Benita. <laughs> all right, Dennis, all right, that's enough. Huh? Now, kid, remember what I told you. Rochester, see who's at the door, please. Yes, sir. Oh, good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Coleman. Good evening. Hello, Manchester. May I... <laughs> May I check your hat, Mr. Coleman? Oh, I didn't wear any. It's so warm out. Uh, how about your hat, Mr. Coleman? No, I didn't bother with a hat living so close. Oh, well, would you like a dollar's worth of nickels? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Nichols? I think the slot machine's about ready to pay off. Why, uh, Ronnie, Benita, welcome to my birthday party. Well, congratulations, Jack. Many happy returns. Thank you, thank you. Come on in the other room. You know my associates. Well, if it ain't the kid from Shangri La. Hello, Ronnie. What do you hear from the High Lama, Bob? <laughs> Bill, Bill, the party just started. Control yourself. <laughs> Uh, here's Mary and Don Wilson. It's nice to see you again. Hello, Mr. Miss Coleman. Hello. Hello. Well, Ronnie, you don't know how happy I am that you and Benita came to my party. It's a pleasure, I'm sure. It's a pleasure, I'm sure. <laughs> well, what's that? Do I hear an echo? What's that? Do I hear an echo? Dennis, cut that out! <laughs> yes, Benita, darling. <laughs> you know, you know, Ronnie... Roddy, you'll have to excuse Dennis. He, you know, he always likes to imitate famous people. You know, it's it really, it's amazing, but sometimes it can be embarrassing. Uh, uh, Mrs. Coleman, here, have a piece of Jack's birthday cake. Oh, thank you. Yes, yes, and here's an ashtray. I mean, a fork, a fork. <laughs> it's very good. No. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Isaac Stern. <laughs> well, well, Mr. Stern, I'm sure glad you got here. Come on in and sit down. Thank you. I'm so tired of standing. Standing? Yes, somebody lifted the bench from the bus stop. <laughs> oh, oh. If that sheet's got a hole in it, we're dead. <laughs> Quiet, Roger, sir. And Mr. Stern, you know my gang, Mary, Phil, and Don. Oh, yes. Hello. Hi. 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 I don't believe you've met Dennis. Dennis, this is Mr. Isaac Stern. How do you do, Dennis? I've listened to you many times on the air, and I've enjoyed your singing very much. Dennis... Dennis, a man paid you a compliment. Huh? Say something. Happy birthday to no. you. No. Happy birthday. <laughs> Dennis, no, not yet. See, uh, uh, Isaac, he's a little excited because it's my birthday. And now, Mr. Stern, I want you to meet two very charming people. They're very, very close friends of mine. In fact, we're neighbors. Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Well, this is indeed an unexpected privilege. Thank you. I feel the same way. In fact, had we known you were going to be here, we wouldn't have hesitated about coming. Ronnie! I, uh... <laughs> oh. I mean, uh, we would have come earlier. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And, uh, Mr. Stern, we haven't seen you since your last concert at the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And it was really thrilling. Yes, yes, it was really wonderful. Mr. Coleman and I were there that same evening, and we were simply carried away. Yes, Mr. Stern, I particularly liked the way you played the Mendelssohn Concerto. I never heard anyone else do the Allegro, so molto appassionato. Well, I think the, that particular movement called for molto appassionato rather than a more reserved approach. Well, I thought... Oh, shut up! <laughs> Mary! Mary, that's no way to talk to Mr. Stern. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mr. Stern, you know, I thought that the Mendelssohn Concerto could be played moto appassionato or allegro con moto. I mean, it could go either way, you know, like, like a Studebaker. I mean... <laughs> I mean... Uh, one has a moto in the front and the other has a moto in the back. <laughs> Mary, we're having a serious discussion. Now, Mr. Moto... I mean, Mr... <laughs> I mean... Mr. Sterno. Uh, Mr. Stern. <laughs> Mr. Stern, I've heard, uh... Mr. Stern, I've heard some violinists play the Mendelssohn Concerto, Moto Appassionato, and others play it Andante. Well, Mr. Benny, that has been a controversial subject. I see. Uh, Mr. Harris, as a colleague and a fellow musician, what do you think? Look, Bob, don't let this monkey suit I'm wearing fool you. <laughs> Phil, please. Oh, Mr. Benny, dinner will be served in a few minutes. Thank you, thank you, Roger, sir. And don't forget to serve the caviar first. Oh, no caviar tonight, boss. Why? That sturgeon's name was Louie, not Louise. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, well, then we'll, uh, we'll just have cocktails. Uh, Mr. Stern, would you consider it an imposition if we asked you to play a number for us before dinner? Oh, that would be wonderful. I'd be happy to play for you. As a matter of fact, uh, sheer coincidence, of course, I just happened to bring my violin and accompanist with me tonight. Hmm. It's my birthday. They could have at least asked me. I would have refused anyway. Who's going to take that chance? <laughs> Never mind. 
Is there any composition you'd uh, care to hear in particular? Mr. Stern, in your repertoire, do you happen to know Open the Door, Richard? <laughs> what? Bonnie, how can you suggest such a thing? Mr. Stern, there's one number I always love to hear on the violin. It's the Vianovsky Concerto. Oh, that's my favorite number, too. How about it, Mr. Stern? Oh, I'd be very happy to play that. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. That was really stuck. Mr. Stern, that was really excellent. John Garfield couldn't have played it better. <laughs> Jack, if you're referring to the picture humorous where John Garfield was a violinist, Mr. Stern did the playing. Oh, yes, yes, I should have known. Uh, you know, Mr. Stern, it's wonderful how in pictures they can always get somebody to do something for somebody else. In Lost Weekend, Phil Harris did the drinking for Ray Milan. <laughs> And for that, they gave him an Oscar. The blue lips? No, no. No, no. Red eyes. And by the way, uh, Ronald, uh, Ronnie, speaking of pictures, you know, I saw the preview of your new one, the late George Atley, and it was simply wonderful. Oh, thank you, Jack. Just recently, I saw one of your pictures, too. And which one? The late horn blows at midnight. <laughs> oh. When did you see it? He went to the funeral. Quiet. <laughs> and now, folks, with a little encouragement, I'll be glad to play a violin solo. Dinner, sir! Thank you, Manchester. <laughs> well, as long as it's on the table, we might as well go in. Come on, everybody. Come on. <clears throat> hey, Jackson, this is the best grub you've ever had at your house. Yes, Jack, I've never tasted such good food. Yeah, what food? These things melt in your mouth. Dennis, those are ice cubes. <laughs> anyway, I'm glad you're all enjoying it. After all, it's my birthday, and I thought I'd go all out. Not out of dime. Mary, please. Hey, Jack, this roast beef is simply delicious, isn't it, Benita? Yes. I wonder if I'd get off for some more. Certainly. Certainly. There's more where that came from. Rochester, more roast beef, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anybody want more butter for their baked potatoes? Yes, yes. Bring in more butter. Yes. Put the sugar bowl in your pocket. It's ours. <laughs> Anybody want more bread, carrots, peas? Bonnie, what are you doing? Emptying the sugar out of the bowl. Oh, you needn't bother. That's ours, too. <laughs> Mr. Stern, why don't you put down the violin and eat something? I thought somebody might ask me for an encore. Oh, we will. <laughs> we'll have that after dinner. You know, I think we've had Benny wrong all the time. This dinner is simply wonderful. Mm, stop talking and let me eat. Me, I'm full. Me, too. Oh, come on. Don't stop. Now, eat some more. Eat some more. No, Jack, I couldn't eat another bite. And I'm not one to make speeches. But if I were king, I love if I were Bobby. king. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Jack, after this marvelous dinner, I want to tell you how much we appreciate your inviting us here. My pleasure, I'm sure. And Jack, this being your birthday, I want to take this opportunity of wishing you many, many happy returns. Happy birthday, Jack. Good luck. Please, please. 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 <laughs> well, my friend, I'm so happy that you could all be here tonight on my birthday. I'm glad you enjoyed the dinner. And I hope that next year... All right, can... folks, you've all had a chance to taste the food. Now listen to me. What? This demonstration dinner was put on here tonight, free of charge, by the lifetime pot pan and kettle. Cup. Wait a minute. Quiet, Bob. It's echo double. Demonstration dinner? The lifetime pot pan or kettle is Look, available in eight different sizes, ranging in price from a dollar and a half to four seventy-five. Come on, Benita, let's get No, you here. don't. Hey, Joe, lock the door. Lock the door? Don't you dare. This is an outrage. We're going... Going? There's one like you at every demonstration. You broke yourself on free grub, then you want to leave. Joe, lock the window. Now, wait a minute. I knew this Now, here's happen. an important fact about the lifetime kettle. It's stainless steel. It's sturdy. I'll show you. Not on my head. Come on, Benita. Let's go. Ronnie, Ronnie, Benita. Mr. Stern, you can't go. Don't go, please. Wait. Wait. Look, Mary, it wasn't my fault. Honest, kids, I didn't know this was going to happen. Well, you know I... Look, kids, answer me. Somebody, say something. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> These pots and pans are guaranteed for life. And make a wonderful birthday, birthday gift for you. Happy yeah, birthday. yeah, happy birthday. Everything happens to me. I was never so embarrassed in my life. It certainly was humiliating. Yes. And I had to play my violin here. I tried to anyway. What an evening. But you know, Benita, that was a delicious dinner. And I was just thinking, 
You know that little party we're giving next Saturday? Yes. Do you think those men would... Ronnie, be... you wouldn't dare. <laughs> Track program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Dante. Hold it, hold it. Jackson ain't here yet. What? Neither is Dennis or Livy. Oh, my goodness, this is awful. What do you mean, awful? The audience is going to get a break today. I've been waiting for a chance like this for months. Hit it, boys. One, two. (laughs) Rochester. Rochester. Yes, sir. Step on it, will you? Can't you make this car go any faster? Boys, did you ever hear the story of the hare and the tortoise? Yes. Well, both of them just passed us. <laughs> hmm, what tough luck. Imagine going out to the garage and finding a flat tire. Not a bit of air in it. It was the new one, too. It had to be the new one. Huh? The other three are filled with sand. <laughs> oh, yes, I forgot. <laughs> Rochester, why have you got the windshield wipers going? We have no windshield. I know, but it keeps the steam from the radiator out of my face. <laughs> no. But say, boss, I think we're making better time. I just caught up with the rabbit that passed us. Rochester, don't be silly. There are no rabbits on Sunset Boulevard. Yeah. What's up, Doc? <laughs> What do you know? I guess the warm weather brought them out. Eh? Gosh, it isn't bad enough I'm late. Mary and Dennis are waiting for us to pick them up. Boss, you should be on the air right now. I know, I know. Turn on the radio and see what they're doing. Okay. Here comes old Bob with all the news. The box back coat, the button shoes. But all paid up with his union dukes, and that's what I like about the sound. Isn't that awful? Here, turn it off. Boy, down. <laughs> That song is enough to make a Yankee out of Senator Claghorn. <laughs> Pull over the corner, Roger. This is where we're supposed to pick up Dennis. There he is. Oh, there's Dennis now. Hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hop in, Dennis. We're late. I know. I was home listening to the radio, and Phil was singing, That's What I Like About the South. I know, I know. My mother said she wished a little bit of heaven would fall from out the sky and hit him right on the head. (laughs) Well, for once in my life, I agree with your mother. She hates you, too. (laughs) All right, all right. Come on, Rochester. Let's go. Oh, Jack, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. Hop in. never been this late before. What happened? Well, we were all ready to go to the studio. When we got to the garage, we found a flat tire. I really should have called for a taxi. Call for a taxi? You wouldn't call for help if it had a meter on it. First place, you read that line wrong. I know. Supposed to be, you wouldn't call for help if it had a meter on it. I was even afraid of that today, this morning. I was... <laughs> what are you talking? I've taken you home from the studio in a cab many times. Oh, stop bragging. You know, it only cost 75 cents. 75 cents? The other night when I took you home, it cost me $3 and a half. Well, it was your idea to go up on Mulholland Drive. <laughs> well, don't let it go to your head, sister. I only, only, only took you up there to show you how beautiful the city looks with the lights on. I know. When the fog rolled in, you wanted your money back. <laughs> money back, money back. Stop making things up. I went up to Mulholland Drive three nights in a row with my girl. And oh boy, did we have fun. <laughs> Why? What what did you do, kid? We went around peeking into new Studebakers. <laughs> Dennis. One of them had eighteen hundred miles on it. <laughs> That must have been a thrilling evening you had. Say, Jack, 
we're so late. Do you think Don can hold the audience till we get there? Phil is entertaining him. I wonder what he's doing now. Rochester, turn on the radio. So listen to your boy whose hair is flaxen. Loosen your tie and start relaxing. When Harris is here, who needs Jackson? Because I'm what you like about the South. Who needs Jackson? What I think. Turn it off. Go see my... (laughs) Rochester, you can park any place now. There's the studio up ahead. Jack, why don't you spend 15 cents and put the car in the parking lot? Because the streets belong to the people, and I'm a people. <laughs> Rochester, what's the matter with you? You just passed a good parking place over there. I know, but that's on our right, boss. This car only turns left. <laughs> oh, yes, I forgot. The steering rod's broken. Well, if this car won't turn to the right, how are we going to get back to Beverly Hills? I got it all mapped out, Miss Livingston. We go straight to Pasadena, left to Bakersfield, left to Oxnard, then down the coast and home. <laughs> Oh, we'll get home, all right Once we get to Carthay Circle We can head in any direction there. <laughs> Now keep your eyes open for a place to... Dennis, we're not on a parade Stop sitting on top of the seat Huh? And take that sign off your back Well, I want it there You don't need it Everybody knows you've got two shows <laughs> Now sit down on the... Whoop, whoop There's a... Whoop, whoop you whoop whooping about? Rochester, there's a place to park right across the street. Yeah. Can't do it, boss. I'll have to make a U-turn. Well, what's wrong with making a U-turn? There's a $2, two, dollar, two dollar double charge. There's a $2 trouble charge for that. that. No (laughs) problem. Boy, all I ask is one rehearsal. That's all I ask. Go ahead. Nobody's looking. Now grab hold of your door, Mary, so it won't fly open. The door's on your side. Oh, yes, yes. Well, here we are. Uh Uh-oh, is that a policeman? It ain't Uncle Remus. (laughs) Hmm. The cop, all right. Shut the motor off. Gee. Well, what are you going to do, Jack? Oh, I'll think of something. Hey, you. The idea of making a U-turn in the middle of the block. Eh? I said, what's the idea of making a U-turn in the middle of the block? Don't you know it's against the law? Well, I'll tell you, officer, I don't get the city very often, so I don't know much about your new fang laws you got here. <laughs> what a performance. <laughs> Ezra, be quiet. You see, officer, I live out Sherman Oaks way, and I just drove my old lady and my boy in to see the big city. Patooey. <laughs> Ain't that right, Miranda? You're down, Tilton. Patooey. Thank goodness we have no windshield. <laughs> Officer, this is the missus. Oh, uh, glad to know you, ma'am. Now, look, old timer, you've got to obey the traffic laws while you're in the city. Well, I'll tell you. Get your gun, Paul. Oh, that man's a revenuer. <laughs> well, officer, guess we'll mow you along. Thanks very much for your advice. All right, old timer, but don't let this happen again. I won't. So long, officer. So long. Come on, Moe and Esri, let's take a look at this radio station, see what those programmies are like. And Zeke, you sit here and wait for it. Zeke. Zeke. Who? Me? (laughs) Yes, you. Come on, Mary. The cop's gone now. Let's get into the studio. Dennis, hurry up. Right behind you, Pa. (laughs) Matui. Dennis, you're not a rube anymore. Put your shoes back on. Fifteen years on the radio, and it's the first time I've ever been late. Thank goodness we got here anyway. She's got baked beans and candy jam, so chill it through it, Virginia Ann. All right, Bill, all right, right. I'm here, I'm here. Well, I, well, Bill, I'm here, you can stop. What do you mean, stop, Jackson? I'm just getting warmed up. Warmed up? You've been singing that thing for 20 minutes. I've been listening to you on the radio. You've been listening to me? Certainly. Well, bless your little gray heart. <laughs> All right, Phil, you had your big day. Now go sit down. Oh, Jack, what happened? How come you're so late? Oh, it's a long story, Don. I had a flat tire, and then I got tied up in traffic, and Rochester didn't know what he was talking about. And right out here, in front of the studio... 
<laughs> well, he was nervous, you know, a cop coming. You can blame him. You know. <laughs> then right out here in front of the studio, a c- cop tried to give me a ticket. I told him I was Jack Benny. He changed his mind fast. Didn't he, Mary? But do it. Now, look, kids, the show is so mixed up, we'll have to start somewhere. So, Dennis, maybe you ought... Wait a minute. Phil. Phil. What's the matter? What are you, uh, your, excuse the expression, musician, dressed like that for? (laughs) Oh, that. Well, the photographer's coming over to take some publicity shots, and I told the boys that if they look glamorous, they might get their pictures in Esquire. Look, Phil, your boys will never get their pictures in Esquire. So you can tell Frankie to put down that white telephone and take off that low-cut sweatshirt. (laughs) And tell him to cover up that tattoo on his chest. Are you kidding? He gets paid for that. I know, but it's such a ridiculous tattoo. This is the year of the yearly. (laughs) What a slogan, the year of the yearly. What about the slogan they had for your picture? Mary. This is the week of the weakling. (laughs) That shows how much you know it didn't even run a week. Now, look, kids, before we start our play for tonight, I think Dennis... What's that? Jack, there's a man in the third row with a gun. Hey, mister, what's the idea? Oh, I'm sorry. I tried to shoot myself, but I missed. Well, what's wrong? I'm a dentist, and my patient is driving me crazy. Your patient? Her name is Nora Prentice, and she won't open her mouth. <laughs> He must be crazy. A few minutes ago, he was a rabbit. <laughs> Sing, Dennis. <laughs> that was... That was How Are Things in Glockamora, sung by Dennis Day. And Dennis, that was a cute little Irish number. Not as cute as the one I took up on Mulholland Drive. <laughs> well, has she got a friend? Yes, but you wouldn't like him. Oh. <laughs> It's been a whole week now, and you never thanked me for the birthday present I sent you. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary. Thanks very much. It was a wonderful gift. I really appreciated it. What'd you give him, Livy? A check for ten dollars. <laughs> well, Mary, it was it wasn't the sentiment, it was the money. I mean it wasn't the money, it was the check. I mean the sentiment. <laughs> now come on, kids, we have a check, a sketch to do. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen. Jack. What? If you ask me, I think you're making a big mistake firing your quartet. I didn't ask you. And now... Libby's right, Jackson. (laughs) Libby's right, Jackson. You should never have fired those guys. Huh? They're harmony. It's great. Phil, when you're talking about pool, I'll take your word for it. When we're talking about bourbon, I'll bow to your superior judgment. Even when we're... If we're talking about new hairdos, I'll acquiesce. (laughs) But when it comes to music and harmony, I'd rather take the word of Lassie's other pup. (laughs) And now, ladies and gentlemen... I think you're right, Mr. Benny. You bet I'm right. I'm glad you're on my side, Dennis. The other side wouldn't have me. (laughs) And the quartet is fired, and that's settled. Now, let's get on with the play. And now, ladies and gentlemen, for our feature attraction tonight... Oh, now what? Come in. How do you do, folks? I'm the photographer from Downbeat Magazine. I'm here to take pictures of Phil Harris's band. Wait a minute, mister. We're trying to do a program. Why are you taking pictures of Harris's orchestra? Oh, they just won a popularity contest that was conducted by our magazine. A contest? Yes. We stopped ten people on the street and asked them who their favorite band was. Uh Uh-huh. And all eleven voted for Phil Harris. (laughs) You stopped ten people and eleven of them voted for Phil? One of them had two heads. <laughs> that I can believe. Hey, wait a minute, Bob. Wait a minute. We ain't posing for just anybody. Are you a good photographer? Oh, I'm one of the best in the business. I have some pictures here that I've taken of my children. Here, look at them. Now, look, we haven't time. Oh, Jack, look at these pictures. Aren't they cute? How old is this little boy? Uh, that's Irving. He's seven. And this little fellow is Julius. He's five. Hmm. Well, how about this cute little girl? The smallest one on the end. If that's my wife. She's a midget. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I, I didn't mean to be rude. That is... Oh, I... that's all right. Quite frequently, I get my wife mixed up with the children. Really? <laughs> yes, only this morning I fed her a bowl of pablum, threw over my shoulder, and burped her. <laughs> oh. 
I didn't realize she was my wife till her teeth dropped on the floor. Her teeth? Hey, what about taking the pictures? My boys are getting nervous. All right, everybody smile now. Watch the birdie. One, two, three, click. Got it. Good, good. Now, if you don't mind, we'll get on with our show. Uh, just a minute. Before I leave, would you mind if I took a picture of your quartet? My quartet? Why? Just to keep for myself. I think they're wonderful. Oh, you do, eh? Well, if you want a picture of my quartet, you can go outside and look for them. I just fired them. You fired them? Yes. You fool, you! <laughs> what? You mean old man! I am not a mean old man, and get out! <laughs> Nobody's going to come in here and tell me how to run my business. But, Jack... Wait a minute, Mary. Now, wait a minute. I've got something to say to you and everybody in the company, and you might as well hear it. I've been on the radio for 15 years. I've always had my own show. I've always run my own show. And I'm going to keep on running it. And you, Don, Dennis, or Phil, or nobody else in the world is going to tell me what to do. And that's fine. Any questions? Why do you wear those thick glasses? Because <laughs> well, they don't cost any more than the thin one. That's why. Now, let's get on with the show. Ladies and gentlemen... Oh, darn it, the phone. Mary, answer it, please. Okay. Hello? Yes? Yes, sir, he's right here. Who is it, Mary? Uh, Jack, it's Mr. Vincent Riggio, president of the American Tobacco Company. Oh, oh, my sponsor. Uh, hello, Vince. Vincent? Oh, Mr. Riggio. <laughs> Well, what, uh, what can I do for you, Mr. Riggio? You've been listening to the show? Wasn't it great? Oh. <laughs> I shouldn't have what? But I had to fire him. That quartet was the worst. You, you don't think so? Well, everybody's entitled to his own opinion. I mean, that's why they put rubber mats around cuspidors. <laughs> <laughs> what? I guess you're right. It didn't get a laugh here, either. <laughs> but about the quartet, Mr. Riggio, I felt that... I know, but... But, Mr. Riggio... I know, but... Yes, but... You might be right, but... 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 But I know, but 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 <laughs> but But, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 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 The Lucky Strike Program, starring Jack Betty, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. Ladies and gentlemen, last week Jack Benny fired his quartet, the sportsman. A few minutes later, his sponsor, Mr. Riggio, called from New York and insisted that Jack rehire the quartet. Jack stood his ground and, in no uncertain terms, said, But. <laughs> But, but, but I know, but, but Mr. Riggio, I, I had to fire them. I mean, that, that quartet was driving me, that quartet was, that quartet, that quart, <laughs> that quart, count me in, Jackson, quiet. 
<laughs> Bill, I'm talking to my sponsor. But, but, Mr. Riggio, if you knew what I went through with those boys, you'd... I know, but I... But I... 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 Take back your rumba. I... Your samba. I... Mary! <laughs> now, Mr. Riggio, I know how you feel about the quartet. I know you want them back. But I don't quite agree with you, so I'll have to think it over. What? I thought it over. Yes. Look how white he is. Well, all right, Mr. Riggio. I'll, I'll see what I can do. Yes, sir. Goodbye. Hmm. Mr. Riggio thinks he can frighten me. He's mistaken. He didn't frighten you, huh? Of course not. I know my rights, Mary. I got a contract to work for Lucky Strike for three full years. And he can't tell me what to do about the quartet. I remember Clause 8 about picking talent. Don't forget Clause 9 about picking tobacco. <laughs> What? And you ain't gonna look so cute in that old straw hat, Buster. Phil! L-S-F-E boom, L-S-F-E boom. Now look! Yes, sir! You bet! Why, sure! I've been smoking Lucky Strike for nigh on a 3,000 years. Damn <laughs> Dennis! Now, wait a minute, Mary. Now, are you sure about that tobacco picking clause in my contract? Well, certainly. Hey, Jackson, don't you read a contract before you sign it? Well, I usually do, but when we started dickering about salary, we got into an argument. My sponsor jumped out of his chair, and then he accidentally stepped on my glasses. What do you mean, accident? You were wearing them at the time. <laughs> well, look, kids, I made up my mind not to take back that quartet. Hand me that phone. I'm going to call up my sponsor and tell it's him... It's long distance. Hand me that pen. I'm going to write my sponsor. <laughs> I'm going to tell him that I've been offered another job at twice this salary. Oh, Jack, how can you say such a thing when it isn't true? And it's only ten days after George Washington's birthday. Gee, you're, you're right, Mary. I, I mustn't tell a lie. You know, Jackson, I had an experience once like George Washington. Phil. Yeah, well, One day when I was a kid, I took an axe and cut down my father's favorite magnolia tree. You mean cherry tree? I'm from the South, son. Oh, yeah. <laughs> When my father came home and saw the tree cut down, he took me by the hand, led me into the living room, stood me in front of George Washington's picture and said, Son, who chopped down that magnolia tree? I said, Father, I cannot tell a lie. I did. And he beat my brains out. <laughs> what? So go be president. Well, I'm going to tell the truth no matter what happens, and I'm still not going to rehire that quartet. But, Jack, if you get fired, what'll happen to us? I'll have to go back to my old job. Oh, don't worry, Mary. You'll still be working for me. Holy smoke, do you own the May Company, too? <laughs> well, gee, May Benny. <laughs> stop, Mr. Dennis. Now, stop. Now, cut it out. This is serious. I'll say it is, Jack. If you, you lose your job, we don't work. And if we don't work, you don't eat. I don't eat. Take the line, if we don't work, we don't eat. Don, you I'm not worried about. You could lose 20 pounds a day, live to be 108, and they'd still have to bury you in a Quonset hut. <laughs> so go be president. I mean, go sit down. Now, Dennis, Dennis, it's time for your song. Come on, let's have it. Okay. My uncle lives in a Quonset hut. He does? Yeah. All right, Dennis, your uncle lives in a Quonset hut. What's the joke? No joke, I just thought you'd be interested. <laughs> Dennis, don't waste time with idle conversation. Now, let's have your song. His uncle lived in a Quonset hut. <laughs> that, was, that was Oh, But I Do, sung by Dennis Day. And now... And now... Now what? I don't know, Mary, this... This quartet thing sure has me worried. You didn't even compliment me on my song. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. It was very good. Then why are you sorry? <laughs> Dennis, he didn't mean that. Jack's very upset. This isn't the first time he forgot to compliment me. What? He hates me because my uncle lives in a Quonset hut. <laughs> Dennis, don't be silly. Nobody hates you. And, hey, wait a minute, Dennis. Wait a minute, maybe you could help me. Huh? Well, you sing, and if you could get three other singers, I mean, we could form a quartet. I have two brothers that sing. Say, that makes three. 
Steve, you only had another brother. Well, I could talk to my parents, but I'm... I don't mean that. <laughs> anyway, I've... I don't know, I've got to think of something. You know, Jack, before I became an announcer, I was a singer. I know, Don, but I need a quartet. Quartet? <laughs> what are you laughing at? If John had a mouth over each one of his chins, you'd have the whole Johnson Choir. <laughs> Mary, there's no time for jokes or remarks like that, either. But maybe I could form a quartet out of my cast. Now, Mary, I know that you sing, and Dennis sings, and... Now, Phil, he's a very good singer, too. That's my boss who said that. <laughs> so maybe we could... Love th that man. Phil. He maybe... said it, and I'm glad. <laughs> Look, Phil, this must lead into a routine. I haven't got time. So let's drop it. Now, look, now, the four of you can sing, so I'll have a quartet after all. That's no good, Mr. Benny. You have to have a male quartet, and one of us is a girl. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, which one? <laughs> I know, Dennis, I know. Believe me. <laughs> but I'm sure of one thing. I'm not going to... I'm not going to apologize. I'm, I'm not going to apologize to the sportsman... Even if I do have to pick tobacco. Don't you worry about it, Jackson. Phil Z ain't going to let that happen to you. What? I got my own show. You can come to work for me. You know, I may have to at that. Say, Phil, if I did go on your show, uh, I mean, what would you pay me? The same thing you pay me. <laughs> Why, you no good, cheap, chiseling <laughs> hand. <laughs> Are you crazy? But, Jackson, money isn't everything. You said that yourself. When? When the blue of the night met the gold in your vault. I didn't ask you. Anyway, Phil, I don't want to be on your show. But, Jackson, look what you could learn just by sitting there and watching me. Me? Learn from you? Sure. My stuff is sharp. It's right up to the minute. Now, ask me something, Jackson. Ask me, uh, ask me what happened to the kid who swallowed a live duck. Phil, I'm not going to... Come on, to... Jackson. Just once ask me. Now, ask me what happened to the kid that swallowed a live duck. Oh, all right, Phil. What happened to the kid that swallowed a live duck? He felt a little down in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Harris, your head may come to a point, but nobody's getting stuck with it. <laughs> Phil, why don't you stick your head in a pencil sharpener and get a haircut? <laughs> Between Don, the quartet, and the sponsor, I just soon quit radio and forget about the whole thing. Oh, Jack, if you're so disgusted, why don't you quit? Look, Mary, if I got the right offer from pictures, I'd consider it, believe me. I'm sorry now I turned down that big part they offered me in the Jolson story. Oh, some big part. When Jolson sang Mammy, you were supposed to run out and put a cushion under his knee. <laughs> Not the part I'm talking about. Mary, why don't you stop kidding when I'm so worried? Well, Jack, if you're so worried about the quartet, why don't you apologize to them and get them back? Look, Mary, I can't humiliate myself that way. I have too much pride. Well, you know what your sponsor said. If you don't get them back, you'll have no job, and no job means no salary. Well, maybe you're right. I'll go find the quartet and apologize. Wait a minute, Jackson. What about your pride? Your dignity? Let Rod and Coleman have dignity. I need a new suit. <laughs> now, come on, Mary. You go with me. Phil, you, Don, and Dennis can finish the program. I can finish it myself. You sure can. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Bye. You know, Mary, this is going to be a mighty hard thing for me to do, but you're right. It's the only way to... Oh, Mr. Benny! Hey, Mr. Benny! Jack, the doorman's calling you. Oh. What is it, Pete? Top of the morning to you, Mr. Benny. A telegram came for you while you were broadcasting, and I didn't want to be disturbing yet. That's all right. Hand me the telegram. Oh, I say, old fellow, a message came for you while you were broadcasting over the wireless. I didn't want to interfere with your proceedings, oh, pip, pip. <laughs> Look, look, will you please hand me the press... Senior Benny, for you came a telegram while you was broadcasting on the radio, I think, and I didn't want... Stop auditioning and give me that telegram. <laughs> yes, sir. Here. Thanks. He hasn't got enough shows. He wants to be on mine, too. <laughs> Mel Blanc. Mary, you read the telegram to me. I don't want my fans to see me with glasses on. Sort of destroys an illusion, you know. Okay. Why, Jack, it's from Fred Allen. Fred Allen? Yeah, he says, uh, Dear Jack, I heard you stand up for your rights and talk back to your sponsors, and I certainly admire your courage and integrity. Well... And, Jack, if you lose your job, don't worry, as here in New York, there's a splendid opening for you. 
All we have to do is lift up the manhole cover. <laughs> well, isn't that nice? He wants me to live with him. <laughs> There's Rochester waiting in the car. Hello, Rochester. Well, hello, Mr. Berry. Hello, Miss Livingston. Hello, Rochester. Uh, Rochester, I want you to drive us to North Hollywood in a hurry. Mary, get in the car. Just a minute, Jack. What are you looking at? That right front hubcap. Did that come with this car? Oh, no, ma'am. That's off a 1947 Cadillac. Really? Where'd you get it? Well, yesterday, Mr. Berry and I were walking down the street. Look. A uh, new Cadillac came around the corner real fast, hit the curb, the hubcap flew up in the air, Mr. Benny made a running catch, laddered it to me, and I took off like Buddy Young in the Rose Bowl. Come on, Mary, get in the car. Okay. She's got backbones and butter beans, ham, hocks, and turnip greens. You and me in New Orleans, and that's what I like about Roger, now. turn that Did off. I tell you about the place called Do What Diddy? It ain't her stuff. Mary, next time don't slam the door so hard it turns on the radio. You know, I feel sorry for the South. First the bold weevils, now Phil Harris. I don't know which is the worst of the two weevils. <laughs> that was a good one, boss. Oh, Rochester, do you really like that? No, but tomorrow's payday and I don't want to have another duel in the sun. <laughs> Now, come on, Rochester. Start the car. Yes. <laughs> hmm. Try it again, Rochester. Okay. Rochester, what's wrong with the motor? Everything, including B.O. <laughs> well, roll down the window and try it again. <laughs> ah. That's better. I threw a cough drop in the gas tank. <laughs> now, Rochester, drive us out of North Hollywood. Yes, sir. Rochester, did you hear my program? No, boss. I was busy fixing the car. Why? What happened? When I wanted to turn on the radio, I slammed the door and the fender fell off. Which fender? The fender. <laughs> the fender. <laughs> oh, well, the next time you slam the door, be a little more... Rochester, what was that? We just terminated our association with the Cadillac Motor Company. <laughs> Oh, my goodness, the hubcap. Oh, Jack, when are you going to get rid of this car? I don't know. I'm thinking of holding an auction at Santa Anita. (laughs) Why don't you get one of those new cars with a hydromatic drive? You know, the ones that have no clutch. Oh, we're way ahead of them. We got no clutch, no brake, no nothing. (laughs) Rochester. If Nora Prentice ever rode in this car, she'd say, (laughs) Plenty. Look, just keep driving, will you? Say, Rochester, if this car has no brake, how do you stop it? There's a hole in the floorboard and I wear spiked shoes. <laughs> well, better start dragging them. There's a red light. Oh, Martha. Martha. What is it, Emily? There's Jack Benny again. Oh, yes. My, but he's handsome. Every time I see him, my stockings begin to crawl. <laughs> oh, Martha, you're acting like a silly girl. Oh, don't be such a prude, Emily. You will have to admit that Mr. Benny is one of the most romantic men in Hollywood. Well, maybe so, but I'm still loyal to Francis X. Bushman. <laughs> you know, Emily, two weeks ago was Mr. Benny's birthday, so I... <laughs> Oh, no, Emily, you'll think I'm silly. No, no, Martha, tell me. 
I sent him a lock of my hair. Oh, Martha. You think he received it? He must have. Look, he's wearing it. <laughs> oh, Emily, I think Mr. Benny is looking at us. So he is. Oh, darn it. I wish I'd worn my bare midriff. <laughs> Rochester, the lights change. You can go. Well, here we are, Mary. Gee, I hate to go in there and apologize to the quartet. Oh, Jack, it's nothing. It'll all be over in a few minutes. I know, but how can you talk to them? All they do is hum and sing. Oh, come on. Let's get it over with. All right, here's the door. Says the sportsman. Well, go ahead and ring the bell. Okay. Bong, 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 bong. Hmm. Hello, fellas. Come on, Mary, let's get out of here. Jack, we're here already. Go through with it. Oh, all right. Now, fellas, I came here to talk to you about your job. I want to tell you that I'm very sorry that I fired you last week. I know I was hasty, but... but... Here we go again. Mary, keep out of this. Now, look, fellas, I want you to come back to my show. How about it? Give us 500 more, only 500 more, and the contract to have and to hold. Well, fellas, you've got a contract for three more weeks. How much longer do you want it to run? It'll be in the time. Long as stars are in the blue. Long as there's a spring and first to sing, we'll go on singing just for you. Well, I'm not going to give you a long contract, and that settles it. Then thanks for the memory of shows we used to do, and they were all with you. But if you're such a dope, we'll work for Hope for Fit Shampoo. Oh, thank you so much. Well, all right, if that's the way you feel about it, I've been in radio 15 years. I never had a quartet before, and I don't need one now. So good night. Good night, sweetheart. We won't meet you Now cut all. that out. <laughs> and goodbye. Come on, Mary. Well, Mary, I tried. I apologize, but did they listen? No. I got to get them back. I don't know what to do. What'll I do? What do they do on a rainy night in oh, Rio? Oh, quiet. <laughs> I'll think of some way to get them back. I'm sorry, Mr. Riggio, but I did all I could. I went to the quartet and I apologized to them. Now, just a minute, Mr. Riggio. I've listened to you long enough. Now, you listen to me. If they want to come back, they can come back. And if they don't want it, it's all right with me. And that settles it. Goodbye. How does that sound, Mary? Fine. Now, let's get to a telephone and call them up. <laughs> tomorrow, Mary, tomorrow. Good night, folks. <laughs> this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Lucky Strike program starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's go out to Jack Benny's home in Beverly Hills, where even as you and I, Rochester is filling out his income tax. <laughs> Let's see. Name Rochester Van Jones. Occupation, butler, chauffeur, cook, gardener, valet, masseur, window washer, and author of What to Do in Your Spare Time. <laughs> now, let's see. Exemption. If married and your wife or husband had no income, or if this is a joint return of husband and wife, list wife or husband. Hmm. I better read that again. If married and your wife or husband had no income, or if this is a joint return of husband and wife, 
list wife or husband. <laughs> yep, that's what it says. That's what the man, that's what the form says. Uncle Sam said that. <laughs> Well, fortunately, I'm single and have no wife or husband. <laughs> now, let's see. Enter your total wages. Oh, hello, Rochester. What are you doing? I'm filling out my income tax, Mr. Benny. It certainly is complicated. I'll help you out if you like. I sure would. All right, let's see the form. Hmm. Oh, Rochester, look at all the occupations you listed. You don't work that hard. Uh, don't, eh? No. I got housemaid's knee clear up to the hip. <laughs> What? And at that point, middle-aged spread takes over. <laughs> Rochester, if you want me to help you, pay attention. Now, let's see. Your income. What was your income last year? Uh, I don't want to tell her what my salary is. Why not? Boss, you pay it to me, and I'm even ashamed to tell you. <laughs> Rochester, you've got to put down your salary. Can I write it in red ink? Red ink? Why? I want them to know I'm blushing. <laughs> Never mind. Now for the next question. List any extra monies you received as gratuities, gifts, or bonuses from your employer. Oh, boss, come now! <laughs> well, let's get on to business expenses. How much did you spend last year? Well, let's see. There was $70 for uniforms. Uh-huh. $20 for a lawyer. Yes. And $50 for advice in preparing last year's income tax. I, I thought I only charged you $40. <laughs> uh, you're, you're lucky it was $50. It gives you a bigger deduction, you see. Now we come to dependents. For every close relative you support, you can deduct $400 from your income tax. Well, let's see. There's my mother... Rochester, I didn't know you supported your mother. Oh, yes, that sweet little old lady. I take her a drive every Saturday night. Your mother? I happen to know that every Saturday night you take my car and go up on Mulholland Drive. And for the million things. Rochester! <laughs> now, don't give me that stuff about your mother. Last Saturday night I followed you and I distinctly heard you mention lean a horn. I said, Mother, don't lean on the horn. <laughs> Sure, sure. Now, Rochester, after you sign this, all you have to do is... I'll get it. Hello, Jack. Well, hello, Mary. I wasn't expecting you. Come on in. Jack, it was such a beautiful day. I thought we might go for a walk. Yeah, let's do that. I feel like going out today. In fact, if you hadn't come along, I was going to call up my girlfriend, Gladys Abisco, and invite her out. Oh, is Gladys still around? Certainly. Why? I thought Louis B. Mayer auctioned her off last week. <laughs> Now, Mary, I don't like the way you're always picking on Gladys. She's got a nice figure. Did you ever see her in a bathing suit? Yes, and she looks like Gary Cooper. <laughs> Only from a distance. <laughs> so what if she is a little thin? She's homely, too. Now, wait a minute, Mary. Gladys may not be the most beautiful girl in the world. I mean, I won't even say that she's the most beautiful girl in the United States. Or in Los Angeles. Or in Beverly Hills. Or in... You know, Mary, I think you got something. <laughs> well, I'll get my coat and we'll go for a walk. Okay, Jack, I'll sit here and read this letter I got from Mama. Well, a letter from your mother, eh? What does the worst years of your father's life have to say? <laughs> uh, I'll read it to you. Go ahead. <clears throat> my darling daughter, Mary. Everything is fine at home, and the weather is getting to be real nice. We're pretty sure that winter is over now, because last month a groundhog came out of his hole, saw the sunshine, and went back in again to wake up Papa. <laughs> what? Papa came out, saw me, and punched the groundhog right in the nose. <laughs> oh, your mother just put that in for a laugh. Now, now, where was I? Uh, oh, yes. Even though it's nice now... Two weeks ago, we had a severe blizzard, and when your Uncle Harry came in from the barn, his milking hand was frozen. Gee. I hope it thaws out soon, as I'd like to get the cow out of the house. <laughs> Mary! 
Mary, you mean to tell oh, me... Oh, Jack, Jack, please. Oh, oh. <laughs> Your sister, Babe, and I are going to the movies tonight and see a new picture. I heard that the picture's all about Jack and his violin. It's called The Beast with Five Fingers. <laughs> Other news, love and kisses, from your mother, the shocking Mrs. Livingston. That's the silliest thing I ever listened to. Oh, wait a minute. P.S. I think your Uncle Terry is thawing out as I just heard a little squirt in the bucket. (laughs) Mary. (laughs) Mary. Look, why doesn't your mother write a letter sometimes without... Oh, who can that be? Hey, Mr. Benny, I came over to ask you if it's all right to... Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello. I came over to ask you if it's all right to... Hello, Dennis. Hello. <laughs> I came over to ask you if it's all right to... How, uh, how do you feel, kid? Thanks. I came over to ask you if it's all right to... Dennis. Dennis, what happened to your face? It's all cut up. I know. When I shaved today, I tried out a new blade. Gee, the way you're cut up. What kind of a blade was it? Single-edged or double-edged? Double-edged. Gee. Well, maybe you didn't have it in the razor right. Oh, razor! <laughs> well, certainly. You're supposed to put the blade in the razor before you lather up. Oh, lather! <laughs> Dennis, then if you don't know how to work a safety razor, why don't you get an electric razor? I mean, that would be easy for you. Well, I tried an electric razor, but that doesn't work either. What do you mean it doesn't work? All you have to do is plug it in. Oh! Now cut that! <laughs> well, kid. <laughs> With all the trouble you have, you're better off going to a barber. Anyway, you haven't got a very heavy beard. I know. I take after my mother. <laughs> Now, look, kid. Kid, what did you want to see me about? Well, I wanted to ask you if it's all right for me to sing You Can't See the Sun When You're Crying on the program next Sunday. Yeah, I guess it'll be all right. Let's hear your arrangement of it. Okay. Uh, We'll leave in a minute, Mary. Go ahead, kid. That was... That was very good, Dennis. In fact, it's one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. And I thought the way you... Who came in? Dennis went out. <laughs> well, why didn't you say goodbye or something? Maybe you're not paying him enough. Could be. Well, come on, Mary. Let's go for a walk. Wait a minute. Hello? Hello, Jack. This is Don. Oh, what is it, Don? Well, Jack, this quartet situation is pretty serious, and I think... Don, I don't want to talk about the quartet anymore. But I just got a special delivery letter. I don't care if you got a... It's from the sponsor. Oh, Sponsor. What does he say? He says, Dear Mr. Wilson, unless Jack Benny has a quartet on his program immediately, next Sunday's show will open as follows. The Lucky Strike program starring Al Pierce. Al Pierce? With Tony Romano, Marjorie Maine, Spike Jones, Stephen Fetchett, and yours truly, Harry Bonzell. <laughs> what? L-S-S-O-S, L-S-S-O-S. <laughs> Don, do you think the sponsor is really serious? I'll say he's serious. This letter is written on a Lucky Strike tobacco leaf. Gee, he uses personal stationery. <laughs> well, I'll see what I can do about it, Don. Goodbye. So long, Jack. Come on, Mary, let's go. Okay. You know, Mary, this quartet situation is a lot more serious than I thought. It certainly is. Starring Al Pierce. Hmm. You know, he's pretty good. He only made one mistake. What was that? He used to go on the air every week and say, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope. And what happened? Hope became a star. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what's the best thing... To- Who's that? Hey, Jackson. Hey, Jackson, come here a minute. It's Phil. Oh, yeah. Hey, Phil. Phil, where'd you get that trailer? Huh? <laughs> that trailer you're pulling. Where'd you get it? Holy smoke, it's hooked on. <laughs> what? That's my garage. Oh. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. I better wake up the maid. She lives upstairs. <laughs> Don't bother, Phil. She probably likes the ride. What are you doing around here, anyway? Well, look, Don called me up this morning and told me you were in a lot of trouble with that sponsor about the quartet. Phil, don't worry about it. I ain't worried, Jackson. I'm thinking about you. What? I'm young and cute. I can get a million jobs. (laughs) (laughs) 
You don't have to worry about me either. I can go back to pictures. But, Jack, they talk in them now. <laughs> oh, stop. Now, look, Jackson, if you don't get a quartet, you're going to be in a lot of trouble, and you know it. Well, yes, I guess so. Why don't you go up to a talent agency and audition some singers? I don't know who to go to. Well, why don't you try my agent? He's terrific when it comes to picking talent. Look what he did for me. Huh? He fixed me up so I'll never have to do another day's work in my life. No kidding. What did he get you? Alice. <laughs> Well, you mean to tell me your agent got Alice for you? Sure, and when we get ten kids, we have to give them one. <laughs> well, Phil, with all your joking, maybe you got something. I'll go and see your agent about a quartet. Okay, here's his card. Thanks, Phil. Thanks a lot. So long, Jackson. So long, Levy. <laughs> Come on, Mary. We'll go and see Phil's agent. <laughs> Jack, here's the talent agency. Yeah, let's go in. See, there are a lot of people in here. Jack, I think that's the agent sitting behind the desk. I'll find out. Oh, mister. Mister. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Are you the man who handles the talent? Yes, Nelson is the name. Low State Nelson. Oh, well, listen, Miss Livingston, and my name is Jack Benny. Well, well, I'd have known you people anywhere. It certainly is an honor that you came here first. Thank you. Benny and Livingston. Yes, sir. I'll make a note of that. Auditions are Thursday, and don't forget to bring your piano player. (laughs) What? Look, I'm not here to audition. I'm trying to replace a quartet on my show. Oh, yes, I've heard them. I've got a quartet here that can take their place, and nobody will know the difference. Good, good. They're right in the next room, the Seal Brothers. Seal Brothers. Well, we can change the name. Oh, no, you can't. Why not? Because they're seals. <laughs> what? Yeah, I'll get them for you. Okay, seals, you're on. <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake, four seals. There used to be five. I gave my wife a coat for Christmas. <laughs> Look, I'm not interested in your wife. You can send those seals back to their cages. Okay, you can go back. He doesn't want you. <laughs> What are they mad about? You broke up their gin rummy game. <laughs> Come on, Mary, let's get out of here. Okay, but I've got another quartet for only $60. I don't care if... $60? Yes. Sit down, Mary. Let's hear that. <laughs> Come on in, fellows. If they turn out to be gophers, there's going to be trouble. <laughs> Look, Jack, he isn't kidding. It's a real quartet. Yes, yeah. Mr. Nelson, what are the names of these four boys? John, Charles, Irving, and Thomas. <laughs> What'd you put Irving in there for? To keep from being sued. (laughs) Well. Well, okay, Mr. Nelson, let's hear him. Why'd you stop them? What's wrong? Well, they're not exactly what I want. Well, very well. All right, boys, you can go. Come on, Mary. I'm sorry I bothered you, Mr. Nelson. Oh, don't go away, Mr. Betty. I'm sure we have something that would... Excuse me. Hello, Nelson Talent Agency. Mr. Nelson left town. What's your complaint? <laughs> and no complaint? This is Nelson speaking. <laughs> yes, we have talent for every occasion. For a wedding? You need what? A violinist. You're willing to pay how much? Six dollars? And dinner? <laughs> now look in my book and see. Violinist, violinist. No, I'm sorry. We don't have any violinists available. Oh, Mr. Nelson, don't hang up yet. (laughs) Jack! Quiet, Mary. Yeah, what is it, Mr. Benny? Ask them what they're having for dinner. (laughs) It's too late now. They hung up. Oh. Now, Mr. Nelson, I think I'll run away. Now, wait a minute. You came in here for a quartet, and I'm going to get you. But I didn't like those four fellas you had out All right, so you didn't like them. I have other talent, you know. Hey, girls, come out here. Girls? Yes, their names are Maxine, Patty, Laverne, and Irving. (laughs) Irving again? No, Irving Schwartz. (laughs) Now, look. Take it, girls. No, no, girl, no. That's not what I want either, Mr. Nelson. Look, that's not what I want either. Stop, girl. Look, Mr. Nelson. Stop! Mr. 
any. Why did you stop them? They're wonderful. But they're not what I had in mind. Mary, what do you think? I like the seals. <laughs> Mary, uh, would you like to interview them? Well, all right. Now, girls, are the, the four of you sisters? I am. I don't know about the other three. <laughs> Well, I have to be very particular about my show. Where did you girls work last? Oh, our last job was in San Francisco. We worked on the top of the mark. Well, that's pretty good. How long did you work on the top of the mark? Uh, two months. Why did you leave? We finished painting the roof. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, look, Mr. Nelson, I'm sure I can't find the kind of a quartet I want here, so I think we ought... Hey, just a moment. The Nelson Talent Agency. What? Oh, yes, just a minute. Fido! Fido! Fido, you want it on the phone. Look, Mary, it's a dog. Ah. Yes, and one of the smartest talking dogs in the country. A talking dog? I don't believe it. I'll show you. Here he comes now. Fido, how old are you? <laughs> Fido, how old are you? <laughs> Fido, hmm. say something. I don't know what to do with him. He's been acting like this ever since he saw Nora Prentice. <laughs> Some talking dog. Fido, if you don't talk, when we have dinner tonight, I won't let you bury your bone in my mashed potatoes. Now, come on. How old are you? I'm seven years old. <laughs> Gee, he can spell, too. Now, Fido, spell cat. <laughs> K-A-T. <laughs> Seven years old, he can't spell cat. <laughs> <laughs> what a joke. Now, look. Look, Mr. Nelson, I didn't come here to get any trick vaudeville act. All I want is a quartet, and you haven't got one that suits me, so I'm going. Now, just a minute, Mr. Benny. I've got another quartet that is positively sensational. Look, they're Russian. A Russian quartet? Yes, I'll call them. Dvorovich, Ivanovich, Stepanovich, Baranovich, come here. How can they tell Vich, Vich is Vich? <laughs> Mr. Nelson, look, I, I can't use a Russian quartet. You haven't heard them yet. But all right, boys. Boys, I don't want to hear them talk. Look, I want to hear them sing. Boys, boys! boys! <laughs> now, Mr. Nelson, I don't want to hear them talk. Let's not waste time. If they're going to sing, let them sing. Okay, come on, boys. One, two. One, two. <laughs> One a bitch, two a bitch. That's not what I want. No, no, that's not what I want. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Mr. Nelson, that won't do. Come on, Mary, let's get out of here. Say, John, where's Jack? Well, Mary, he had to leave. He's on Phil Harris's show. Gee, I didn't know he was going to work on Phil's show. Yes, I heard them talking in the hall, and Phil offered him some money. Oh, money. <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, last Thursday night, the Academy Awards were given out to a favored few. All the Hollywood celebrities gathered at the Shrine Auditorium to take their hats off to the winners. And so tonight, we bring you the man who had the hat check concession, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, you shouldn't have introduced me as the man who had the hat check concession at the Academy Awards. I was master of ceremonies, too. <laughs> <laughs> and Don, having the hat check concession certainly taught me a lot about those so-called big stars and pictures. What do you mean, Jack? You should see the tips they leave. <laughs> Terry Grant, 15 cents. <laughs> Clark Gable, ten cents. 
Margaret O'Brien a nickel. <laughs> I felt like throwing it right back in her face. I couldn't believe it. I, I thought that, you know, I never thought that small tips. I thought that tambourine I had on the counter would help a little. <laughs> what? And Don. Don. You know Rex Harrison? Yes. A shilling. <laughs> How do you like that? He thought because it looks like an American quarter, I wouldn't notice it. A shilling in this country? Well, what can you do with it? Let the owl drugstore worry about that. <laughs> I had breakfast there this morning. <laughs> Anyway, Don, it was really a thrill seeing all those stars get those awards. Harold Russell, Ann Baxter, Frederick March, Olivia de Havilland, Ray Milland. Ray Milland? Did he win something again this year? No, he won an award last year. He just came back to get a new cork for it. <laughs> anyway, Don, the whole affair was really exciting. Well, tell me, Jack, who else was there? Well, it was Jane Wyman, Gregory Peck, Lionel Barrymore, Larry Park, Dinah Shore, Hugo Carmichael. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh... Hugo Carmichael? Jack, you mean Hoagie Carmichael. Don, if Hugo is good enough for Sam Goldwyn, it's good enough for me. <laughs> but, Jack... Don, I know what I'm doing. I never worked for Goldwyn. I'm not going to louse up my chances. <laughs> anyway, Don, it was such a wonderful affair, I was proud that they picked me as Master of Ceremonies. Well, Jack, I can understand you're being honored and thrilled. As a matter of fact... I, too, have something to be proud of. Really? What, Don? Well, this is television week, and they've asked me to appear on a television program. You on television? Don, Don, let me look at you, will you? Don, Don, wait a minute. Turn around again, will you? No, no, it'll never work, Don. It'll never work. You, you, you can forget about television. Why? They'll never get a 60-inch beam on a 10-inch screen. <laughs> Believe me. Oh, Jack, I wish you wouldn't kid me about my size. I'm not so fat. You're not, eh? How about the time you got stuck in the Hollywood Bowl? <laughs> I remember... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, Don. Hello, Mary. What are you talking about, fellas? Oh, the Academy Awards, television, and Don's stomach. You can take your choice of subject. You know. Well, I picked television. And, Don, I read a wonderful poem about it. A poem about television? Well, let's hear it. Okay. Television is here to stay, and it won't be hard to sell it. Now you can hear and see Jack's show, and soon you'll be able to smell it. <laughs> smell it, Mary. Don't talk about my show. Have you ever tuned into Fred Allen's program when the wind is from the east and your air conditioning is fighting a losing battle? <laughs> enough to make you lose faith in your air wick. <laughs> I'm just teasing. If you want to know something, I went to the Academy Thursday, and I thought you were wonderful at Master's Ceremony. Well, thanks, Dollface. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I still had a feeling that when they're giving out the awards, you thought the committee was unfair. I thought the committee was unfair? What gave you that impression? You were the only one on the stage with a picket sign. <laughs> I wasn't picketing. The sign said, keep your eye on your own hat and coat. I'm on the stage now. <laughs> I wasn't a bit jealous. When Olivia de Havilland won her award, I walked right over to her, slapped her on the back, and said, Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at, Barry? <laughs> then Olivia slapped Jack on the back. His toupee slipped down over his eyes, and Jack whispered, Kiss me, honey. The lights went out. <laughs> that was a long speech, and you got it out. But that's what happened. <laughs> I'm always worried about those long speeches. <laughs> That could happen to anyone, really. Oh, but seriously, Jack, I thought you looked wonderful up there on the stage. And that good-looking tuxedo. Where'd you rent it? I didn't rent that tuxedo. I know you didn't buy it. Now, come on, where'd you get it? Mary, let's drop the subject. By the way, where were you sitting? Who oh, about the tenth row? And, Jack, you'll never guess who was sitting right in front of me. Who? Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. Ronald Coleman was there? What was he wearing? A, t <laughs> a tuxedo. Well, you beat me to that, Joe. <laughs> 
must have two of them. <laughs> Jack, you... Mary, said... we made a deal. Ronnie loaned me a tuxedo, and I returned his lawnmower. <laughs> Now, what's the use of being neighbors? Hello, if... Mr. Benny. Hello, Mary. Hello, Hello Dennis. Dennis. I'm sorry I'm late, Mr. Benny, but I had trouble with my new car. Dennis, I didn't know you had a car. Yes, my first one. When I drove down to the studio, I had to go around the block 86 times before I ran out of gas and the car stopped. Well, that's the silliest thing. Dennis, when you want to stop a car, all you have to do is step on the brake. Oh, brake. <laughs> now, don't start that again. And now that you're here, let's have your song. What's it going to be? Well, tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day, so I thought I'd like to sing Johnny God. Well, in short, and I'd be disappointed if you didn't. Go ahead. That was... That was Johnny God's song by Dennis Day. Very good, Dennis. Oh, bless you. May your cows never go dry. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Mr. Benny, I sang that song for my mother. You what? I sang that song for my mother. Oh, well, it certainly is an appropriate song. I don't know anyone more Irish than your mother. Yeah. She wouldn't see the Jolson story till I told her it was the life of Pat O'Brien. <laughs> no. And she liked that new picture about Jerome Kern. Which one? Till the McClouds roll by. <laughs> till the McClouds roll by. I bet his mother thinks NBC stands for Nolan, Brannigan, and Cassidy. Well, as long as it keeps her happy, I guess it's... Hiya, Livy. Hello, kid. Sorry I'm late, Buster. (laughs) Well, Phil, look, it's about time you got here, you know. Well, it wasn't my fault, Jackson, and I got a good excuse. Yeah, yeah, I know. You're going to tell me that you overslept, jumped out of bed, dressed as fast as you could, and rushed over here. Hey, how did you know? You left a curler in your hair. All right, so I got a curl in my hair. I overslept a little. I'm sorry I'm late, and let's forget it. Forget it? Unless you want to make something out of it. No, I don't want to make anything out of it. Phil, you must have gotten up on the wrong side of the bed. Why? You've got Alice's shoes on. (laughs) Yeah. How do you like that? I told her a thousand times, put them under the pillow, Blondie. Put them under the pillow. Look, Phil, stop kidding. You wore Alice's shoes for a gag. You got your laugh. Now take them off. What are you talking about, Jackson? We need that kind of laugh. Sight stuff. Television is here. I know, I know. Ah, television. That's when I'll shine. When yeah. people can hear and see Harris. Shangri-La with a ham hock. <laughs> Isn't that awful? You know, folks, he really thinks he's handsome. Phil, what makes you so egotistical? I ain't egotistical. I'm much better looking than I think I am. <laughs> So you're not conceited, eh? Not me. In my family, Alice is the one who's conceited. Alice? Yeah, she thinks she's prettier than I am. <laughs> Why, the ingrate. After all the years, you let her support you. Do it. <laughs> now, Phil. Phil. Stardust eyes. Narcissus boy. <laughs> hey, Slamiel. What? <laughs> How about picking up your baton and making like you're leading a band? Then see if you can't. Who can that be? Come in. Yes, Mr. Benny. My name is Lewis. On last Thursday night, the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences gave out their annual award. Yes, yes, that's right. At that affair, you were the master of ceremonies, weren't you? Yes, yes. In fact, I was on the stage during the entire proceeding. Oh, that's what I want to see you about. There's an Oscar missing. <laughs> Now, wait a minute, Mr. Lewis. Does the Academy Award Committee think for one minute that a man in my position, a celebrity, a star for 15 years, a man who is respected by millions, would stoop so low as to steal an Oscar? Yes. (laughs) Oh. He borrowed the tuxedo, too. Mary, please. Mr. Lewis, I consider that an insult, and I wish that you'd get out of here now. Now, go on. Get out. All right. But before I go, there's another matter I want to talk to you about. The Owl Drug Store. Get out of here. (laughs) That's gratitude for you. The Academy Committee calls me up, asks me to be master of ceremony, so I accept. What happens? Do I get any thanks? No. Do I get any salary? No. Just taxi fare and a lousy cheese sandwich. (laughs) 
No butter. Hey, Jackson, what about my band number? Just a minute, Phil. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Bennett. It's Rochester. Hello, Rochester. What do you want? I'm in a lot of trouble, boss. You shouldn't have asked me to bake a loaf of bread for dinner tonight. Why? What happened? Well, I took a small bowl and put in two cups of flour. Uh-huh. Then I put in a cake of yeast. Uh-huh. Then I added one cup of water and stirred it together. Well? It looked kind of dry, so I added more water. I see. Since I added more water, I threw in another cake of yeast. <laughs> well, isn't that a lot of yeast? That's what I thought, so I put in more water. More flour. <laughs> more flour. More flour. Yeah. More flour. Yeah. <laughs> that made it too dry, so then I added more water. Rochester. That made it too soggy, so I put in some more yeast. More yeast. So to balance the pro- uh, the, to balance the pro- proportions, <laughs> I added more flour. Well, you balanced that one. You didn't let it drop anyway. Yeah, I, I balanced the proportions with more flour. Flour? That made it too dry, so I poured in a quart of champagne. Champagne? I had to do something to break the monotony. <laughs> Roger, sir, that's ridiculous, mixing champagne with flour, water, and yeast. We got the only loaf of bread with a bun on it. <laughs> now, stop being silly. You made this whole thing up, and you know it. <laughs> I thought so. Now, come on, Rochester. What'd you really call me for? You know that thing you brought home Thursday night that you woke me up to show it to me? Yes. Do I shine it with brown polish or gold polish? Don't bother shining it. I have to give it back. (laughs) Goodbye. Oh, say, boss. Now what? See you, rascal, you. (laughs) Never mind. Goodbye. Goodbye. Except the wildest things I've ever heard in my life. Now, Don, what about the quartet you say you've got? Dennis is here. Where are the other three fellows? Well, Jack, they ought to be here any minute. In fact, here comes one now, Andy Russell. Andy Russell! <laughs> Andy! Andy, I can't believe this. I mean, do you want to be in my quartet? Why, well, sure, Jack, if it'll help you out. Gee, this is wonderful. Dennis, this is Andy. Where's Amos? <laughs> it's not the Andy and Amos and Andy. This is Russell. Not that Russell. <laughs> now, Andy, I'm thrilled with having you in my quartet. But, uh, uh, uh... That's Portuguese. For how much money do you want? <laughs> yes, Portuguese. I mean, how much money would you want? Oh, $35 a week. $35 a week? Mm-hmm. I can't believe it. Well, would 30 be all right? <laughs> no, no, I'm perfectly willing to pay $35. You must spend at least half of that for tooth powder. <laughs> <laughs> It must be wonderful to have such sparkling tea. Well, it has its drawbacks. Huh? Well, when I talk to Don and Michi, we blind each other. <laughs> I can understand that. Well, anyway, Andy, you Oh, hold it, Jack, hold it. Here comes another member of the quartet. Dick Haim! Dick Haim! I haven't seen you since you were on my show three years ago. Oh, I know, Jack. It's nice to be with you again. Well, thanks, thanks. But tell me, Dick, why are you wearing those dark glasses? Well, Andy Russell might smile, and I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, the tea. Mary, Mary, you remember, uh, you remember Dick Hames, don't you? <laughs> Mary! Dick, I'm certainly thrilled having you as a member of the quartet, but, uh, 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 what? What's the matter, Dick? Can't you understand Portuguese? <laughs> Dick, what I'm trying to say is, well, if you're going to be in the quartet, how much money would you want? $35 a week. $35 a week? Well, now, Jack, if you're going to start haggling, just forget about it. No, 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 I'm not haggling. I mean, I... I think you're worth every cent of it, you know? But, of course, I can't make it... Hold it, Jack, hold it. Here comes another member of the quartet. Bing Crosby! (laughs) Bing Crosby? When the blue of the night meets the gold of the day, (laughs) L.S.M.S. 
Bing Crosby. I can't get over it. You were expecting maybe a transcription. <laughs> I'm so surprised. I'm so surprised to see you. By the way, Bing, how's Dixie? Half Senator Clagg on. <laughs> oh, Crosby, you shouldn't have wasted that one here, hoping to give you two bucks for it. <laughs> well, we needed that one. Now, Bing, believe me, I'd love to have you as one of my quartet, but, uh... Fifty dollars. I understand Portuguese. Fifty dollars? Wait a minute, Bing. Andy Russell and Dick Hames are both willing to work for thirty-five dollars. Why do you want fifty? I got four kids. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, I read where you're going to put him in the movie. Yeah, one of them is almost nine. He's been loafing around the house long enough. I think. <laughs> well, look, fellas, I know that you're all good singers individually, and Dennis has been with me a long time, but do you think you can all give me what I want as a quartet? Um... <laughs> Wait a minute, fellas. That's your idea of a quartet. You're starting off on the wrong foot. <laughs> Don't worry, Jack. Don't worry. Now, look, fellas, you tried, you meant well, and believe me, I appreciate it. But you boys just won't do. What? what? How do you like that? Now, you can leave your names, and maybe something will come up. <laughs> so long, fellas. There's no use talking. I just got to get my old quartet back. <laughs> I want to thank Bing Crosby, Dick Hames, and Andy Russell for being with us tonight. It was very nice. Hey, uh, Jackson, just a minute. What is it, Bing? Weekly Variety, which is the outstanding newspaper of the entertainment world, has given you an award for your 15 years in radio. They feel that your weekly clam bakes on the air have been consistently right in the groove for, lo, these many years, and I agree with them. Congratulations. Well, thanks, Bing. Thanks very much. On behalf of my cast and writers who have been with me so long, I want to thank the Variety for this honor. And say, Bing, it was nice of you to make this presentation to me, but I wish you'd do me a favor. Sure, Jack. Anything. What is it? After all, we got a classy program. The next time you come over, tuck your shirt in, will you? I mean, mean, those palm trees waving around upset me. (laughs) Good night, folks. The Lucky Strike Program, starring Jack Benny, with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, four weeks ago, Jack Benny got into trouble with his sponsor because he fired his quartet. Despite the fact that Jack auditioned several singing groups, he could find no suitable replacement. So now we find Jack at home, where he has just started to type a letter to his old quartet, the Sportsman. Gentlemen. Now, now that sounds too businesslike to start off with. Let's see. Dear Sirs. Now, now that's still too formal. I've got it. My darling sportsman. (laughs) That's it, yeah. My, my darling sportsman. Now, that's a little too personal. I'll knock out the my. (laughs) Now, let's see. Fellows, I hope you will receive this letter in the spirit in which it is sent because... Whoops! (laughs) Silly me, it's only us. I am willing to let bygones be bygones. I know that you boys want more money, but... 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 (laughs) Gee, I even do it on the typewriter. Now, let's see. I know you want more money, but that can be discussed later. I realize that apologies at this point would be superfluous. Hmm. Superfluous. S-U-P-U. No, no, that doesn't look right. 
Oh, Rochester, how do you spell superfluous? S-U-P-E-R-F-L-U-O-U-S. Thank you. <laughs> Would be superfluous, but I'm sure we can iron out any discrepancies. Hmm. Rochester, how do you spell discrepancies? D-I-S-C-R-E-P-A-N-C-I-E-S. Thank you. <laughs> Iron out any discrepancies that may come up. Yours sincerely, Jack Benny. B-E-N-N. I know how to spell it. <laughs> Rochester, do you think this letter will do any good? I don't think so, boss. They wouldn't even talk to you when you went to see them. Yeah, I guess so. Anyway, this letter isn't right. I'll throw it away. Rochester! Rochester! What's the matter, boss? What happened? I had my tongue caught in the roller. <laughs> it hurts. Let me see. Ah. Mmm, you spell superfluous wrong after all. <laughs> Never mind. Gee, Rochester, I don't know what to do about a quartet. Well, boss, I thought the quartet you had last Sunday was pretty good. Yeah, each one of them is a great soloist. Dennis Day, Andy Russell, Dick Hames, Bing Crosby. But I know, but when you put them together, what have you got? Personally, I'd rather have Hugo Carmichael. <laughs> You know, boss, if you need any help, I can sing a little bit like Mr. Crosby myself. You? When the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. Ba 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 boo, ba ba boo, ba ba boo hoo. Rochester. Rochester, if you think you sing like Bing Crosby, then I play the violin like Yasha Heifetz. Oh, you do, boss, you do! <laughs> Thanks. Excuse me, there's someone at the door, Yasha. I'll get it, Bing. You put the typewriter away. Hello, Jack. Oh, hello, Mary. I wasn't. I was expecting you earlier. Well, I would have been here sooner, but I was working out in the garden all morning. You were? How are the flowers coming? Fine, only I shouldn't have bought the seeds at the corner of Hollywood and Vine. Why not? I was wearing a sunsuit, and the snapdragons kept snapping at me. <laughs> I don't blame them, Livy. You've got better stems than they have. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jackson, it's only the second day of spring, and you're in full bloom already. <laughs> Jack. <laughs> Jack, why must you always go along with a gag? Because I feel good. But, Mary, it doesn't seem possible the flowers in your garden are up already. You only planted them a few weeks ago. I know, but I scattered plenty of Vigoro around. That stuff really makes things grow. It does? Vigoro, huh? Say, I wonder if... No, and anyway, it would look messy on your head. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of that. But you know, Mary, I like gardening and flowers and growing things. You know, in fact, I saw a preview of a picture the other night. The egg and I. It was wonderful. Claudette Colbert is married to Fred McMurray. And they live on a little farm where it's quiet and peaceful. And they raise their own chickens and eggs and grow their own food and everything. Gee, I wish I had that. A farm? No, Fred McMurray. <laughs> Well, I can see you're not the type that's interested in farming. Now, look at me. In my garden, I raise carrots, peas, lettuce, all kinds of useful things. Well, Jack, I know it saves you a little money, but I think you're going too far. What do you mean? You even grow rice in the shallow end of your swimming pool. <laughs> I do not. And Mary, if you keep talking like that, next fall, when I pick my grapes, I won't let you help me make wine out of them. Good. I had enough of that wine making last time. My feet were purple for two weeks. <laughs> All right, all... it stained my bathtub, too, you know. I'll get it, Bing. Okay, Yasha. <laughs> oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Come on in, kid. Hello, Dennis. Hello, Mary. I passed your house this morning, and I saw you working in the garden. Boy, that sunsuit you were wearing. <laughs> Dennis. 
My mother has a sunsuit just like Mary's, only it's yellow. Oh, really? Yeah, when she wears it, she looks like the Wiltshire bus with lace bumpers. <laughs> well, look, kid, Mary and I are leaving for the studio in a few minutes. Have you any idea what you're going to sing today? Oh, sure. Well, let me hear it first, and then we'll... Hey, Dennis. I just noticed it. You've got a scratch on your nose. How'd you get it? Well, I was riding down here on a bicycle built for two, and I ran into a telephone pole. Well, how did that happen? There was nobody on the front seat to steer it. <laughs> well, Dennis, why didn't you sit on the front seat? I've got two shows. Why should I drive? <laughs> oh, for heaven's sake. Come on, kid. Let's have this Dennis, that was a lovely song. I'm glad you're going to sing it on the program. You really... Dennis, what are you taking your shoes off for? Isn't it time to make the wine? <laughs> no, not till after we pick the cotton. Oh. Lift that bale. Tilt that bar. Well, come on, kids. We'll go to the studio. Huh? Say, say, Mr. Benny, what are you going to do about a quartet? I don't know. I want to get my old quartet, the sportsman, back, but I don't know how to go about it. Say, Jack, I've got an idea. Why don't you go over and talk to their manager? I bet he'll help you get the boys back. Well, I say that might help at that. Rochester, get the car out. We're going into town. See you later, Dennis. Rochester, try the starter again. Oh, Jack, we've been trying to start the car for 20 minutes. Let's take a cab. Don't worry, Mary. It'll start. Rochester, try it again. Yes, sir. <laughs> Step on the starter again, Rochester. Yes, sir. It's not long for this world. Rochester, maybe maybe there's something wrong with the spark plug. I don't think so. I cleaned them both this morning. <laughs> Oh, we'll try it once more. If it doesn't work this time, we'll take a cab. Yes, sir. It started. It started. Off we go into the wild blue yonder. Yes, sir. I knew it could do it. Oh, why don't you get a new car? I never heard a motor that carries on so much. I know, Mary. It's a little mad at me since I made a joint after us. <laughs> Rochester, take us to 1507 Benedict. Well, this is their manager's house, Mr. Stewart. I wish I'd sent my lawyer to sort of pave the way for me. Pave the way? Yeah, yeah. You know, talk to him first to see how he feels. Say, Mary, you can do that. Oh, but Jack... Go ahead, ring the bell. I'll hide behind the hedge. Oh, okay. Yes? Uh, how do you do? My name is Mary Livingston, and I work for Jack Benny. Oh. Well, go around to the back door. I'll give you a cup of coffee. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> uh, can you spare two cups of coffee? Certainly. Come on out, Jack. I paved the way. <laughs> very funny, very funny. Now, look, Mr. Stewart, I didn't come here only for coffee. I came here to talk to you about the quartet. Well, come right inside and we'll talk it over. Good, good. Come on, Mary. Well, I'll wait in the car. Okay, this won't take long. Now, Mr. Stewart, to show that my heart's in the right place, I'm willing to take the quartet back and not deduct anything for the three weeks they've been off. Well, I have the new contract all prepared, and if you'll just sign it, everything will be fine. Gladly, gladly. I'll sign right... Wait a minute. Look at this Clause 8. Why are these words scratched out? Well, we made a slight change in the clause where it said they have to mow your lawn. <laughs> slight change? Now you have to mow their lawn. <laughs> now, wait a minute. I was over to their place and they live in an apartment. They don't even have a lawn. I know, but they're going to buy a house in Beverly Hills where there'll be plenty of grass. Well, how can those guys afford to buy a house in Beverly Hills? Read Clause 9. <laughs> Let me see. 
I, Jack Benny, party of the first part, agree to pay to the party of the second part $5,000 a week if I... $5,000? Look, if I pay him that much money, they'd have to be the stars of the show. Read Clause 12. <laughs> now, Mr. Stewart, I don't mind paying him a little more money, but this Clause 14 is ridiculous. I'm not going to do their laundry. I don't know what you're so excited about. You've been doing it for months. I've been doing the sportsman's laundry? Well, certainly, didn't you know? Mr. Stewart, I'm a busy man. When Rochester brings in the bundles, I don't ask them who they're from. <laughs> if you stand around asking questions, your water gets cold. <laughs> if, you'll take out, if you'll take out those ridiculous clauses and make the same deal we had before, I'll sign the contract. Okay, okay. Here's a pen. All right. There you are. Now, where are the sportsmen? Well, I don't know where I can locate them, but if I do, I'll send them to your studio. Good, good. And thanks very much, Mr. Stewart. Okay, Rochester, here we are. Let us out right here. <laughs> Come on, Mary. Rochester, you can go now, and on your way home, stop at the automobile club and get some maps. I'm going to drive to San Francisco next week. You're going to take this car up to San Francisco? Yes. <laughs> what are you laughing at? It'll be easier to bring San Francisco down here. <laughs> Just make sure those two spark plugs are working. I'll get there. Come on, Mary, let's get in the studio. Jack, why are we going to San Francisco? Well, we're going to do our broadcast next Sunday for the San Francisco-Oakland Newspaper Guild. I like San Francisco, Mary. The weather's so crisp, the scenery's so beautiful, and ah, the Golden Gate. Stop trembling. It's only painted that color. <laughs> no, but it's so nice. Oh, my goodness, look at the clock. The program's already started. Let's hurry. Hey, here's another one, Don. Ask me why fat men always wear suspenders. Okay. Why the fat men always... Hold it, hold it. I'm here now. You can sit down. Sit down. Look, Buster, why did you stop me right when I was in the middle of a joke? What? I got the audience in the palm of my hand. I was telling gags and singing songs, and they love me. They love me. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Phil. Quiet. Don't call me Phil. They think I'm Al Jolson. <laughs> Al Jolson? When April showers may come your way, yeah. <laughs> they bring the flowers, those pretty little flowers. Mammy, can't you hear Jolsey boy? Phil, Phil. Home. Phil. Come, Phil. Come home, Mammy. Phil, come Phil. Home, Mammy. Phil. <laughs> Mammy, don't stop me, Jackson. I got him rolling. It's downhill from here. <laughs> How do you like that? He was out all night, can't get up off his knees, and he thinks he's Jolson. <laughs> all right, all right, Phil. If you think you're such a great comedian, go ahead and tell that fat man joke I interrupted. All right, thanks, bub. Come on, Dante. Ask me why a fat man always wears suspenders. Okay, Phil. Why does a fat man always wear suspenders? Because he's afraid his stomach will make his belt buckle. <laughs> Bell? Buckle? You heard me. Those things on the side of your head ain't bookends. <laughs> I know. And, Don, I'm surprised that you fell for a joke like that. You, of all people, should know why fat man wears suspenders. Well, I don't wear suspenders or a belt either. And what keeps your pants up? The NBC censor. <laughs> oh, Wilson, you take up half the stage, but you're worth it. <laughs> What, what kind of a show is this? Phil is Al Jolson, Don is Phil Harris. Mary, who would you like to be? Mrs. Fred McMurray. Now cut that out. <laughs> Seems the only sensible one around here is Dennis. Just call me John Charles Thomas. <laughs> well, it's my own fault for... Thank heaven, and I don't care who it is. Come in. Well, look who's here. Hmm. My old quartet, the sportsman. Boys, I can't tell you how happy I am to have you back. No, don't hum. I can, I'll do the talking. And, Mr. Stewart, uh, you came with us. Yes, Mr. Benny. I knew how anxious you were to have them again and to hear their glorious voices, so I spared no effort to find them today. Isn't that right, fellas? Hmm. Oh, shut up. <laughs> you see, Mary, it's not only me. <laughs> fellas, I'm glad you're back, and from now on, I'll let... Excuse me a minute. 
Hello? Mr. Benny? Yes? <laughs> Mr. Benny has a car. G-R-A-S-H. It's a car that won't go far. C-R-A-S-H. With a no clutch here and a no brake there. Here and Nick, there knock, everywhere and Nick knock. Rochester! I'm not finished yet! You are too, and goodbye. I like my car, I like my cash, I like my quartet, and Phil, I even like your lousy band. Let's hear it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, next Sunday night we're broadcasting from San Francisco. Now don't forget, kids, we want to be there for their big frolic Saturday night. Mr. Benny, I don't want to go on such a long trip. What? Last time I went to San Francisco, I was on the train for eight days. Eight days? What are you talking about? You get on the train here at night, and the next morning you get off. Oh, get off! Oh, quiet. Good night. Broadcasting from San Francisco, the Lucky Strike program, starring Jack Benny. Mary Livingston, Rochester, Dennis Day, Phil Harris's orchestra, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, on last Tuesday night in Los Angeles, with bands playing and trumpets blaring, the star of our show boarded a special car on the Lark. And on Wednesday morning, after a night of excitement and anticipation, finally arrived in San Francisco and was met at the station by a red cap. And here he is, Jack Benny. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, you're absolutely right. Imagine after the mayor, the Chamber of Commerce, and the newspaper men of San Francisco begged me to come up here, there was no one to meet me at the station but a red cap. I was so mad, I carried my own bag. <laughs> and I'm going to stay mad till I get back on the train. Well, anyway, Jack, even though you didn't get a reception at the station, at least you had the honor of coming to San Francisco in a private car. Well, Don, it wasn't exactly a private car. It, uh, it was more like a... Drawing room? Well, it, uh, it wasn't exactly a drawing room. It was more like a... Compartment? What's a compartment? <laughs> well, uh, a compartment has an upper and lower berth in it and a chair. A chair? Hmm? No, this wasn't a compartment. <laughs> Forget it. Forget about it, Don. By the way, uh... By the way, how how did you come up here? Oh, I came up on the TWA bus. The TWA bus? Don, the TWA is an airliner. It flies. Not when I'm on it. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> now I know what they mean by ceiling zero. <laughs> Anyway, Don, we got here, so let... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Mary, I don't know what's come over me, but I've never seen you look so pretty before. Your complexion's so clear, your cheeks so rosy. Have you got on your new makeup? No, you've got on your new glasses. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. And, Mary, I have these glasses made especially for San Francisco. Look at them. Well, I don't see anything different. Look closer. Well, I'll be darned windshield wipers. <laughs> and uh, yes, and not only that, wait, Mary, press the press the little button on the bridge of my glasses. What? Go ahead, go ahead, press the button. Okay. Holy smoke, built in fog light. <laughs> yes, sir, there's nothing like Mary, what are you sticking your finger in my ear for? I'm checking your gas and oil. <laughs> Mary, don't be silly. By the way, where are you living here in town? At the Sir Francis Drake. Where are you? I'm at the Fairmont Hotel on the top of Knob Hill. How do you get there, Jack? By cable car? No, no. You ought to ride them sometime. Mary, if I want to get to the top of Knob Hill, I'll get there. Yeah, but what you won't do to save a dime? <laughs> What do you mean, Mary? Well, yesterday I saw Jack going up Powell Street with spiked shoes, a rope, and a pick. <laughs> well, I made it, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> yes, but when you got to the top of the hill, you didn't have to yodel. <laughs> Look, I wasn't yodeling. Then how come you got fan mail from three goats in Berkeley? <laughs> 
Because they got fountain pens that write under milk. <laughs> I can go along with a gag, you know. Honestly, Jack, every time you come to San Francisco, you have more trouble. <laughs> What are you laughing at, Barry? Well, yesterday we were taking a drive to Oakland. You mean over the Bay Bridge? Yes. When we got to the toll gate, I reached over to pay the man, and before I knew it, Jack flew out of the car, jumped into the bay, climbed up back on the bridge, handed the man the quarter, and said, Butterfingers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, Jack, you want to know something? What? That man told me he dropped it on purpose. He knew you'd jump in after it. <laughs> dropped it on purpose, eh? Well, it wasn't a wasted trip, sister. We're having barracuda for dinner. <laughs> barracuda? How in the world did you catch a barracuda? I didn't catch him. He followed me out with my new glasses. I look like a mackerel. <laughs> now, let's get on with the... Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I work in the San Francisco post office, and we have thousands and thousands of letters that say, I can't stand Jack Benny. Huh? Oh, oh, well, that, uh, those must have been sent in for the contest I had last year. They were sent this year and have nothing to do with the contest. <laughs> hmm. Well, I'll pick them up before I leave San Francisco. I wish you'd hurry. One of them is ticking. Well, you can forward that one to Fred Allen. That's who it came from. Now, cut that out. I'll come to the post office in the morning and pick them up. And as for you, Mr... Mr... Jones. What? Jones. Jones? J-O-N-E-S? Yeah. Well, I want to shake your hand, Mr. Jones. I really do. Jack, what are you so excited about? Who is he? I don't know, but he's the first guy I've met in San Francisco whose name isn't DiMaggio. <laughs> That's my first name. All right, get out <laughs> I had a fall for a thing like that. Well, Jack, it's just as I told you. Every time you come to San Francisco, you have trouble. Mary, I don't have any trouble. People love me here. You should have seen the crowd that turned out for the newspaper men's frolic last night. And, Jack, didn't you and Bob Hope do an act together on the Damon Runyon Memorial Fund benefit last Thursday? Yes, we did, Don. In fact, I was one of the masters of ceremonies, and I introduced Bob. Gee, I like Hope. He's so glib, and he talks so fast. You're telling me. When I introduced him, I said, Ladies and gentlemen, this is Bob Hope. And between Bob and Hope, he told 12 jokes, sang two choruses of Thanks for the Memory, and made a new picture called The Road to Tanferan. <laughs> what a man. You know, he'd be a great comedian if he could only play the violin. Mary, stop looking at me like that. If I'd had a good lunch, I'd punch you right in the nose. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What? Hello, Mr. Benny. Oh, hello, Dennis. Dennis, I, I haven't had a chance to talk to you since you got in town. Where are you living here? Oh, I've got a wonderful suite with 16 bathrooms. A suite with 16 bathrooms? Where? In the basement of the Fairmont Hotel. <laughs> oh, oh, well, are you comfortable there? Yes, but I can never get to sleep. Why not? All night long, a man with a whisk broom pe keeps brushing me off. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> too bad, Dennis. It was such a good line, too. Huh? <laughs> And you know what, Mr. Benny? What? Going without sleep has made me lose an awful lot of weight. What do you mean, kid? Well, this morning I weighed myself four times and the arrow always pointed to zero. What? I don't weigh anything. <laughs> no, there's something wrong, Dennis. Maybe after you put in your penny, you wiggle around too much when you stand on the scale. Oh, stand on it! <laughs> Yes, you have to stand on it. Now, come on, Dennis. Everybody's here to anx anxious to hear you sing, so let's have your song. Okay. Well, Mr. Benny, you know, when I put my penny in the weighing machine, a card came out with my picture on it. Your picture? Yeah, and guess who I look like? Who? Betty Grable. <laughs> what? I can't understand what Harry James sees in me. I can't either. Go ahead and sing, will you, kid? Go ahead. That was Wyoming, sung in San Francisco by Dennis Day, who lives in Los Angeles and was born in New York. And now... Gee, what a trip just to sing a song. Yes, yes, a trip. Say, Dennis. 
Dennis, we looked for you on the train. Why didn't you come up with us from Los Angeles? Well, I had to wait a couple of days because my mother and father wanted to come. I thought I'd treat them to a little vacation. Oh, did you drive up in your car? No, we took the night train. Mother slept in the lower berth, and my father and I shared the upper. You and your father in an upper berth? That must have been awful. Well, we wouldn't have minded that so much, but our dog wouldn't get off the pillow. <laughs> oh, your dog was in there, too? Yeah, she sure picked a fine time to have pups. <laughs> Well, it's your own fault, Dennis. Why in the world did you bring your dog to San Francisco? Oh, I hated to leave her at a time like that. Oh. Well, it's nice of you to be so considerate, and congratulations, by the way. And now, kids, if you'll all sit down and be quiet, i got a surprise for you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have as our guest star tonight a very fine actress who, because of her great performance on the screen, was recently nominated for the Academy Award. Here she is, Miss Jane Wyman. Very nice of you to say that. Well, I meant it, Janie. I thought you gave a sterling performance in the yearling. That's yearling. Oh, yes, yes. I thought you gave a sterling performance in the yearling. I mean, sterling. Um, well, Janie, it must have been a great personal satisfaction for you being nominated for the Academy Award. Oh, it was, Jack. I was never so excited in my life. Well, Janie, Janie, how did you feel about Olivia de Havilland winning the Oscar? Well, Jack, I thought she deserved it. I think Olivia gave the finest performance of the year. Well, I know, but weren't you even a teensy-weensy bit jealous when somebody else got the Oscar? No, not at all. Gee, that's funny. When Frederick March won it, I could have spit right in his eye. <laughs> I was furious. <laughs> But, Jack, you had no right to be jealous of Frederick March. You didn't even make a picture last year. I know, but I made one three years ago, and people still remember it. There's an answer to that, but I think my mother might be listening. I see, I see what you mean. Uh, at least, Janie, you were nominated, and there's always another chance. Who, who do you think will be nominated next year? Tom Dewey. <laughs> oh, go feed your pups. <laughs> Janie... You may not know this, but next year, I'm going to make a picture that will be so sensational. Hello, Janie. How are you? Why, Mary, it's good to see you again. You look wonderful. Now, in this picture, I play the part... Janie, isn't San Francisco an exciting town? It certainly is, Mary. And the shops have so many new fashions. In this picture, I play the part... Did you see the new spring clothes they're showing here? See them? I've already bought two of the darlingest suits at Mason Mendesal. In this picture... You know, I got a dream of an evening gown at Magnus. It's chartreuse, and the bodice is covered with sequins. In this picture, I play the part of a Chartreuse, and they're... <laughs> Mary. I mean, I mean, there's a scene where Mary, I... Mary, you know, they have the most gorgeous things in the lingerie shop at Ruth Brothers. Real two-way stretches and everything. Now, look, girl. And I picked up some of the cutest hats at Red's. Wait hospital. a minute. Oh, and you should see the suede alligator shoes I got at O'Connor and Moffat. Wait a minute. And, you know, they have silk two-piece bathing suits that are strapless and back. Yeah, and you know... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now, in this picture, I... What did you say about strapless bathing suits? And... <laughs> Nothing. And you should be ashamed of yourself talking about your own pictures when you have a star like Jane Wyman. Well, I congratulated her, Mary. I told her she was wonderful in the yearling, didn't I, Janie? Yes, you did. And the technicolor and scenery in the picture were the most gorgeous I've ever seen. Where did they shoot the picture? In Hollywood? No, it was filmed in, uh, you should excuse the expression, Florida. <laughs> oh, oh. Well, you certainly gave a great performance. And I also think that Gregory Peck should have won something for running around on all fours and jumping over logs and <laughs> leaping over fences. Jack, that was the deer. Oh, oh. Well, I thought he was kind of cute, too. But it was... <laughs> No, no, Gregory Peck was the man with the straw hat. Oh, well, I saw the picture before I got my new glasses, you see. <laughs> I sat so far back, the third row, too. <laughs> Janie, I haven't had a chance to see the picture yet. What was the story about? Well, Gregory Peck and I were running a little farm, and we were face-to-face -face with poverty. We'd worked 18 to 20 hours a day, and, and year after year of back-breaking labor, and we didn't have a penny to show for our toil. Gee, I wonder where they got an idea like that. 
Oh, Rochester gave it to them. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine him selling his diary, isn't it? Uh, what were some of the things you and Gregory Peck raised on the farm? Well, there were potatoes, the yams, cotton, and our best crop was tobacco. Well, it took a long time, but you finally got around to me. Oh, you're Don Wilson, aren't you? Yes, ma'am. Don Wilson, in the flab. <laughs> Look, Don, we were just discussing... Jane, what are you staring at Don like that for? Now, I thought San Francisco had a bay. <laughs> Simon, you're only a guest, but you're just as corny as they are. <laughs> yeah. Well, Miss Wyman, I saw the yearling, and I was very impressed, but there's one scene that I'd like to ask you about. What is it, Mr. Wilson? In that heartbreaking scene when your son ran away from home, and with tears in your eyes, you were running through the fields looking for him. Yes. It's time for a band number. Come on, let's dance, everybody. <laughs> The coffee song played by Phil Harris's orchestra and directed by Mr. Malin Merrick. Uh, that is your name, isn't it? Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Merrick, it was nice of you to fill in for Mr. Harris since he couldn't be with us today. And I want to tell you that I've never heard Phil Harris's band sound so good. How long have you studied music? One week. <laughs> Well, what made you decide so recently that you wanted to lead an orchestra? Well, I'm a conductor on a cable car, and I don't know how long they're going to last. (laughs) Oh, I see. Well, thanks again for helping us out, Mr... Mr... What is that name again? Merrick. Malin D. Merrick. Now, what's the D for? DiMaggio. (laughs) I should have known, huh? Jack, why couldn't Phil come up here with us? Phil, well, you see, Mary, Phil has his own program for Fit Shampoo, which follows my show. And when I go out of town and Phil has to choose between the two programs, naturally, he chooses the one with the bottles. (laughs) But um, he'll be with us next week. You know, Jack, I'm sorry Phil Harris isn't here today. I think he's awfully cute. Do you, Janie? Mm -hmm. There's one thing I can't understand. What do women see in Phil Harris? Oh, I don't know. He's handsome and impetuous, and he has sex appeal. Well, don't you think I have sex appeal? (laughs) Well, in a gay 90 sort of way. (laughs) Now, wait a minute, Janie. How can you say that? You've never even kissed me. Come on, give me a kiss. Right here in front of everybody? Why, certainly. Come on, Janie, kiss me. Mm, Well, all right. There. (laughs) Well, maybe he's not as old as I thought he was. (laughs) Look at the sparkle in his eyes. Don't get excited. Those are fog lights. Mary. If it's not Governor Warren, it might be Herbert Hoover. (laughs) What? Don't you read the papers? Oh, quiet. (laughs) Jack hasn't read anything since Monday except Newsweek because his picture's on the cover. You said it. And if I do say so myself, I look pretty good. Go on, I've sent out laundry that looked better than that. <laughs> Mary, you're just jealous because new... Well, J.D., we certainly had an exciting week up here, didn't we? We certainly did, Jack. And I want to thank you very much for being on my program and also for appearing at the newspaper frolics last night. Oh, it was lots of fun, and I always enjoy coming to San Francisco. Me too. Herbert Hoover lives in Palo Alto. <laughs> I know, I know. Dennis, why don't you pay attention to what we're... Pardon me. Hello? 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 Who is this? Your favorite brunette! <laughs> Rochester! Rochester, where are you? I'm in Sausalito! Sausalito? What are you doing there? Nothing! Nothing. That's the main industry here. <laughs> they what? They've got so much of it, they export it. Oh, you mean, th- you mean things are kind of quiet over there? Quiet? Over here, they think no apprentice is a blabbermouth. <laughs> now, wait a minute, Rochester. I didn't give you permission to go over there. I know, boss, but I had a couple of spare hours on my hands. Uh-huh. And I was, well... Uh, Kind of low 
lonesome. Yeah. And then I remembered I knew a girl over here. Yeah. And it's spring now, boss. Spring! <laughs> All right, so what happened? The main industry, nothing. <laughs> Well, look, Rochester, were there any calls or messages for me at the hotel? A few, boss. What were they? Well, the hotel barber came up to the room about ten minutes after you left. The barber? Yeah, I got a shave and you got a haircut. <laughs> Rochester, how could he give me a haircut when I wasn't even... Oh, oh, oh. Well... <laughs> I hope it was the blonde one. I want to wear it tonight, huh? See you later, Rochester. So long, boss. So long. Oh, say, boss. Now what? My girl and I have been listening to the program. What'd you think of it? Are you sure you've got a contract for the next three years? Yes. Lovely, lovely. <laughs> Never mind. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, I guess you can't fool all of the people all of the time. Playboy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank everybody here in San Francisco for being so nice to us. Also, Janie Wyman, who appeared on the program through the courtesy of Warner Brothers, who are the producers of that new picture, Cheyenne. Be sure to listen in next Sunday when we will have as our guests Mr. Samuel Goldwyn and Hoagie Carmichael. What about Herbert Hoover? Dennis. Good night, folks. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.